I think Mr. Lindbacher is going to be a little bit late, so he'll catch up when he gets here. Yeah. Uh, so good evening. This is uh, Thursday, September 28th, the uh, Situate Planning Board hearing. Uh, we have an agenda that's been posted. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. First on our agenda is informal discussion, the potential development of the MBTA parcel. And it looks like we have people here going to talk about that. <laughs> yes. Thank you. So if you would introduce everybody so we know who we're talking to. I'd be happy to. Uh, my name is Attorney Robert Galvin. I'm an attorney from Duxbury. Uh, I, my practice principally is a land use and municipal law firm. Um, I am here representing the Drew Companies today. Uh, as to my right is John Drew, who's the chairman of the firm. Uh, Theoe Alicandro, she's general counsel for the Drew Companies. To my left is Jim Sandell from Car Lynch and Sandell. He's on the project team, and uh, they've seen him before. Yes, we have. Yes, we have. And uh, seated uh, to right behind uh, Theoni is uh, Bob Walsh, who's a development consultant in connection with this project. Okay. Um, I'm just going to speak for a couple of minutes and let the people that have all of the details give you the concept uh, as best Great. we can. Well, um, welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. This is a conceptual plan um, that we will be hopefully submitting soon in the Village Business Overlay District, which is a special permit granted by the Planning Board. Um, the property is located, uh, as you know, off the old driftway. If you've had a chance to look at our plans, uh, we did provide Mr. Washburn a little earlier today with an electronic copy uh, of our concept at this particular stage. Uh, we did meet a little earlier just to introduce the project to Mr. Washburn and Ms. Joseph, um, so you'd have uh, so they'd have a little bit of chance to preview it before you did. Uh, but this is very much a concept. We're looking for uh, positive, negative input, uh, so that we can present to you in a very short order uh, this project for mixed use development. Uh, the 75 units, about 11,430 square feet of retail space. Um, and I'll let people describe the, the parking requirements because we do have some obligations to the MTA to maintain portions of the parking lot. Um, is, is it condos or apartments? It, apartments. Apartments. Yes. And we haven't determined the actual breakdown of one, two, three bedroom, how that's going to work out, but it would be approximately 75 units. Uh, we won't be looking for a, a bonus, uh, density bonus for this project at, at this particular stage. Um, so with that, why don't I turn it over to Theoni, and you can give us a, or, or John. No, you, listen, Theoni's much b better at this. <laughs> <laughs> so. And uh, they can give you a little bit more of the yeah. details, and then we'll get That's you right. straight to the architectural and design team. Uh, just before you skip over me, I just want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come down uh, and to have the informal discussion with you about the project. Um, we're very excited about the project. but. Uh, we know that, quite frankly, what we would like to do is have something of high quality that's being built on that site. We, we, we expect that over the years that site's going to be surrounded by other activity um, as well. So we want to have something that works uh, for, for the present and hopefully helps you into the future as, as, as the other sites around it get developed. Um, and we uh, particularly enjoy the opportunity of coming down there to sort of express our ideas with you and get some feedback. Um, knowing, uh, get your judgment to, as to what would fit best and feel best. So thank you for this opportunity. Let me turn it over to the owner. Well, let me uh, just say that we appreciate you coming in on an informal basis because we highly encourage that, particularly as we get the bigger developments. So this is quite uh, quite a good process for us. Um, and. I will second the notion of having something of high quality. There. <laughs> well, that we, we've we've obviously worked out that we basically um, have the site under agreement with the MBTA. Right. We're trying to finalize the, that in the next, literally the next 30, 60 days, uh, with them. But we wanted to have this meeting with you in, in order to see if we're on the same track mm -hmm. uh, with the town that that, that you feel comfortable with with the direction we're moving, so we can back and finalize with the MBTA. So it's and that's your, the process. Your agreement with the MBTA is it. Um, is it contingent on getting permits to do things? I mean, is there a, a process no. or is it just a purchase and sale? Purchase and sale. sale. Okay. The only. Thank you. Um, yeah, as John mentioned, we do have an agreement with the MBTA to purchase the site. Um, on the first page of your document, you'll see the yellow outline. That's the site. Um, 
this was actually produced by the MBTA. It's, it's not an actual survey, so it's not 100% accurate, but it gives you an idea of, of what the site is. Our agreement with the T is um, to provide them with 196 parking spaces. Um, so as you can see on the site, um, that leaves us with roughly about half of the site um, left to develop. Um, so we were trying to come up with, um, you know, a, a, an intimate, vibrant um, development here um, that we thought would address the, the needs of the town, um, address um, the desires of, of the residents, and um, also to uh, accommodate the requirements that we have with the MBTA. Um, so as John mentioned, uh, we have 75 units we're contemplating right now in um, four uh, four buildings, um, and then we have a fifth building on the site as well, which is just a small retail uh, coffee shop or something like that right on New Driftway. Would, um, you, would you mind if I interrupted you? Uh, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm looking at the layout here. It mm -hmm. looks like part of the parking is, is it not part of the parcel? The, these it's parking not part spaces? of the parcel. They, I think they paved it on uh, other. On somebody else's yeah, property? Yeah. Huh. They did. So it doesn't belong to the MBTA either. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's what we did not want to take on the obligation of maintaining that little part since it's uh -huh. not actually owned by them. Gotcha. <laughs> um, as, as you know, um, back uh, at the last um, town meeting, the parcel in blue uh, was actually town owned, it's still town owned. Um, the obligation between the MBTA and the town, we're, we're not touching that that will continue as is uh, unless anything changes and the town ends up deeding that to anybody in the meantime um, just one thing to clarify back in that meeting um, there seemed to be confusion about our project at one point it was described as a 40b project it is not so I just want to make sure that everybody understands that um, we are uh, expecting to uh, comply with the affordability requirements 15% of our units um, so roughly 11 units on the site um, would would comply with the affordability, but it's it's not an actual 40B site. Um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Jim to talk about the specifics on the design and, and why we put the buildings where we did. And Jim, I think one thing that we should start with it is that this is really a complicated site. When you think about it, it's on a rather precipitous slope. Uh, it's surrounded by a precast factory, a, a, a transfer station, a dog pound, and a, a railroad track. So and that's what we like most about it. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that kind of adds up to a challenge. Uh, one of the one of the comments uh, at when the town voted to not uh, sell the piece their piece of land to the uh, to the T. Uh, several people stood and voiced their opinion to building a project here, and they described this as a, uh, like a st strip mall. This is not a strip mall. One of the things that we wanted to pay the most attention to was that it would be incumbent upon us to create a, a, a really nice place to live if you're there, and that would take some effort with using the buildings as buffers and screens and also creating some positive environmental things. And uh, if you couple that with the MBTA selling their site but actually keeping half of it uh, for cars, that already creates a bit of a challenge. So parking this uh, was it really difficult to get enough cars for the MBTA to create cars for our, uh, for our tenants uh, and for our retail and you know public it was really a stretch so it's a it's a work in progress we've got pieces moving around if you took a snapshot at this point in time there it is and it complies you know but we know we can improve it and we we, we did all this without your input so mm -hmm. we wanted to get here on an informal basis as soon as we could so that we understood and you guys understood and that we can kind of put something together that we all really like and am I looking at the the MBTA parking is in the back, so the furthest yes. from the train? Yep, yep. And, and what they don't have any criteria about <clears throat> where the parking needs to be? Well, we, we've reviewed this with them, uh -huh. uh, and they're satisfied with the site plan as uh -huh. is. Yeah. Their, their biggest concern was keeping their parking in one. as close together so that they didn't have issues on who's parking in the right place, mm -hmm. snow removal and, and 
things like that. So. so they can drive through and make sure everyone's parked in the right spot and there's no, uh, you know, problems with residents or shoppers parking on the T property illegally. So um, that was a, kind of a, a major effort and uh, I think we accomplished it, but it still needs, needs some polishing for sure. So if we go through the, the drawings that we gave you in this brochure, uh, sheet two and three, sheet two shows the existing contours. Now, compared to the contour plan, this was not done by our, our consultant. So with the uh, EPW dug it out of past information they had from past developers who made proposals for the property so uh, we're not sure that it that it's correct uh, it is correct we do believe in terms of the site perimeter which uh, if you notice on the front page the MBTA plan had an inaccuracy actually showed they said that their parking went down to the right of way on old driftway it doesn't uh, that's town-owned land it goes down to Kind of show them. right about that. So this this is town-owned land. This is our land. So there's a lot of things like that that we're kind of arm wrestling with. Um, if you look at so I'm I'm sorry you you said that you qualified this drawing as not necessarily accurate as the topography. Is that what you're saying? At, are you talking about the, the uh, topo plan? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I said we inherited it. Uh, the first thing we'll do when we kind of, kind of reach a consensus that this is the right direction, I think we'll verify the, the, the contours that have been drawn. Okay. Just to be sure that we're not surprised later. Okay. So uh, sheet three shows uh, site parking for concept A and the the parking is the difficult, so what we did is we translated the dimensions in the buildings, the, the three residential buildings, C, D, and B. Uh, B is a mixed-use building. It's one level of retail that's on a storefront along Frontage Road. And building A is totally a retail building. So um, the, the numbers that are shown there uh, have uh, the 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 parking requirements generated by a first blush at how many units are in each building and what kinds of units that makes a difference in terms of what we have to park so we've gone through that exercise and come up with those numbers and they're listed on the left side for retail parking uh, coffee shop residential parking and total number of residential units so we've we've been able to do it it's a a challenge but we're convinced that we can do that with the footprints that we're showing which is a good thing uh, if you look at the next plan which is four of 14 that has a that has an earlier plan that we looked at that has a different configuration of how C and D get uh, put together we showed a, a link between the two that is circulation it becomes more efficient for the two buildings and uh, gives us more parking underneath. I think that the, one of the main concepts that we want to describe to you is if you look at, it's, it's uh, sheet number eight, eight of 14, it says site section through buildings B and D. And uh, the, the slope as we go up the hill, developing a building section where we have the ground floor as parking and then we have a podium built above that a steel podium steel and concrete where we can either stick build or put uh, modular construction for the residential so what it does it gives us a real advantage because we're if we had to park the site it was a if you call it a more traditional apartment where the parking was around the building we would eat up all of the site for all of the amenities we want to have the green spaces the, the walkways the pedestrian space and we get an advantage of it's a it's a good way to, to do a cut and fill as we go up the hill and it 
offers the amenity that the parking for the residents of C, D, and B is underneath their building. So elevator down, elevator up, snow, wind, rain. Uh, it's a, it's a, it essentially a garage that we can create by stepping the uh, contours of the foundations. So that's something I think we, we uh, really like. And it does, like I said, it offers us imagining if we had to park 24, 24, and 29 cars yet again outside of the footprint of the building, that would be. So are you, are you sort of terracing this lot then? Yeah. Yep. And so you're in the front along the old driftway. Yeah. And you're going to do a lot of cut there. You're going to lower no. the elevation to get closer to the sidewalk elevation? Not, not. Not a, it's not our land. It's the town's land. So we have to deal with the property line at the top of the berm. So that's what we've taken as the, the beginning point for, for so what, our site. In your, in your elevation, where is your property line in this? Oh, okay. It's uh, to the far. Is it the uh, far left? Yep, it says far left. Driftway? That's correct. That's not the street? That's the edge of the right of way. It shows the berm going down, and then old driftway, sidewalk. So we're we're entering the site on the ends, South Road, North Road, and we've created those as access to the parking uh, up the hill, the MBTA uh, reserve parking, and we also use those two roads for when we go up the hill, we'll exit underneath and enter underneath the buildings for B, D, and C off of that perimeter road. So it, it's a very efficient road. We get to use it for access for people uh, in automobiles coming home and South Road, North Road, MBTA parking as well. So it's, we've, we've taken full advantage of that access. Uh, who knows what the MBTA is going to do in five years, ten years with that piece of land. They might sell it again. So we need to, in some ways, give thought to how that could be developed. Hoffman. So, so B and D are dumping onto South Road and then C. That's right. C dumps onto the North Road. That's Is correct. That, so we, that's the in and out right there. Right. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there's no parking under A. Correct. Okay. Correct. A, uh, we've cited, if you, if you stand at the corner of uh, New Driftway and Old Driftway, down by the, the lights, the semaphores, and you look up at the site, if you look on the very back of, of this program, uh, if you look at sheet 13, it gives you a pretty good idea of the topography. It shows the green strip going up, you know, down to where the entrance is across from the entrance into the into the platform and the tracks, uh, but you can see how it climbs up. So uh, that's going to stay. And what we're showing is retail building A has a rotunda that's part of the building, and it will sit on the high part of the site. So when you're down at the driving, or if you're driving in your car and you're down at the intersection, the main call it the main intersection. You'll be able to look up and across, and you'll be able to see that kind of that building, which is out of the. It's not. It's obviously not a residential building, but a retail building. <coughs> so, the perspective 12 or 14 up above the uh, photograph, during the the actual site, is a sketch we've done of what that rotunda might look like. Um, if you. Peel back one, 11 of 14. We have an illustrative conceptual plan of the building footprint. And what we've, what we've created, which I think is a, really a positive amenity, is a uh, road connector that goes from north and south where it comes through. And what, what we've done is we've put the entrances to all the residential off of this connector. So if you're in an automobile, you can come in this way and go in and park and then go over to the core and come up. Or if you're a guest, you can come up and park in front and go in. Uh, entrance for 
building B is on this side as well. So what our, our goal was to have a public space here, and we're showing a, what we call a public courtyard, that works in conjunction with uh, the retail at, on building A. Uh, the, in the plan, in this plan, there shows a uh, little greenhouse configuration that sticks out into the space, and this would be a public space. The orientation is great in terms of the sunlight and the wind and protection from the road and the train. So we're trying to create that public space as an amenity for all the people that live here and all so for the public. Uh, people that live off site come. The visitors would come and park in that right in the center spot. In that center place, right? Gotcha. Now the building A is you know, we've given a lot of discussion about what the best use would be. Uh, John thought the, the brewery was a great idea, but that idea was taken. So. <laughs> I, I always wish the brewery. <laughs> so, you know, I guess my gut feel was it'd be a great place for a small uh, market, you know, that served food, served organic food, made, had a deli you could do takeout. You could roll out of bed. Uh, if you live up above in the apartments up above, you can watch, see when the train's about to go. You can <laughs> roll out, come out, walk down, walk through the courtyard, get your coffee, uh, and Where's then Richard? walk out the front. And <laughs> I the know, I'd love it. So that looks like a Starbucks. And <laughs> conversely, on the way home, you can just go the reverse route. You could go back up to the market, through the market. Uh, there's a lot of great examples of kind of businesses that do this have great prepared food. You get it and walk up and you're, you're good to go at home. Yeah, so. I, I'd, I'd add one thing. We did, uh, unsolicited, uh, we received a number of phone calls from people, from people, and I would say probably five or six, but two of them who uh, live in town, mm -hmm. who have an interest in the retail there for restaurants or, you know, the primary restaurants. So, I mean, this is with no, this is just with the publicity we got um, at the hearing. Mm -hmm. So, we got the strong interest there. Uh, yep. And the idea of the, of, the, of the building having being circular and whatnot being seen as the road is the yeah, idea is, 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 is make it something that catches your eye, you want to come to it, it's different than mm -hmm. simply going on to strip stores. And uh, that, I think, makes a big difference. And you have the terraces in front and the terrace in the back, I think, which again gives you all to a seating in the good weather. Mm -hmm. But it gives you a place, for, easy place for people to come into. And uh, <laughs> both, from the t both when they're coming back off the train or if they're, if they're living there. And, and, and the visual access. orientation of the r residential is, it looks like it's going towards Old Driftway and not towards the, uh, towards the river and all that. Those are typically uh, center quartered units on both sides and on the ends. So the, the end units in each building, C and D, would be, call it the primo unit, because mm -hmm. you'd, have, you'd have two orientations. Yeah. And, uh, we have a mix of two and one bedrooms, uh, and a, we're starting with a kind of market standards of maybe 1,150 mm -hmm. square feet for a two bedroom, 800, and 800 square feet or 850 for a one bedroom, and 600 for uh, studios, apartments. Mm -hmm. Now, getting the mix right is something yeah, that a lot of a lot of energy is being put into that, uh, but. That's kind of the, what we've done for the for the, it, it, the. The view out towards the water is is, is it, it'd be nice if you put all around. Just with the uh, you can't uh, create uh, the courtyard piece the way we would like to see it if you if you're doing that. So we play with skewing it for mm -hmm. better views, and I, you know, I, I think uh, I think we'd, we'd like to work a little bit more on that. Um, the other thing we discussed briefly today is whether or not we should be using parallel parking as opposed to pulling in, uh, you know, the nose to the curb parking and doing something along those lines, which again would, I think, from your perspective, from the town's perspective, might be beneficial in the future as well, because if you're going to drive, if the T does do something there, you're going to be driving through the T at some point and doing something with property above it, I think you want to think about this as basically an access point. So this is something we had to consider when we were doing this, but and we talked a little, bit, a little bit earlier this evening that's something we'd be happy to consider too. Mm -hmm. The way we've shown the 
we feel all driftway frontage lane, but we have we have all the uh, retail kind of oriented out toward old driftway. But there's a there is a climb from the sidewalk up to the, uh, the the street level that runs through there, and our our thinking is that this is not a uh, a street where pedestrians are going to walk from one end to the other. I mean, Newbury Street, this is not. People coming to this site are arriving by automobile. Like, you know, all the buildings up and down uh, Driftway, New Driftway, they have the same template where you drive in and you get out and you go into the store. The parking isn't kind of hilly-nilly and gone. Uh, so we, we base this on, if you drive out um, Route 9 and you go to Chestnut Hill, before you get to the Chestnut Hill Mall, there's a, a stretch of retail that's really quite beautiful, high-end retail. But it does this. It, it comes off of Route 9 and parks. And then you cross over and you go into the retail stores. And the whole bases of all the, the ground floors are really beautiful retail glazing, you, you know, what you want. And then up above are either offices or high-end residential. So this is the, the kind of the same dimension and uh, we thought it was really important that we park that, and that's all retail parking. And we've, we've done the count based on the, the, the zoning, the criteria, counting the area of the retail in A and B, and dividing by the number of square feet per uh, space needed. Uh, we come, there's a chart up above that says, shows you uh, building A is 8,600 square feet, uh, 200 square foot for a space that's 43 spaces needed. Building B is almost 3,000. Again, that's 14. So you you add that up. You need by by the town standard, we need 57 parking spaces. So you can show how we accommodated that. That's what we took as what we wanted to provide. So so I. Uh, we can go through. Let me let me show you. I think the other thing that, that's really effective is to look at uh, the aerial. We did an aerial in there. View shows kind of where we are. Okay. So Hoffman, Dog Pound, uh, you know, tracks, the transfer station. And so we're trying to really intensify this strip as our entrances to all of the residential and to kind of the retail with, with the courtyard facing out. This is retail parking. But to make this kind of the super pedestrian friendly, and we can do it with paving along that road where the cars are actually on pedestrian turf instead of having the vice versa, mm -hmm. having asphalt kind of saying it belongs to the automobiles. So we'll, we'll put a lot of energy into kind of how this street gets landscaped and developed. And then we're showing a, a fountain that shows in the, the plan of the retail building. Um, you know, fountain, a great thing in back there for both the noise and a gathering place, and kids and families and the like. So I think we're, we're excited about making that work really well. And then there's one other view, uh, uh, page 9 of 14. It's the Greenbush Lane perspective. And what that's, the emphasis there is having the cars be on pedestrian turf. And here we are. This, this is looking up. And the, the retail center is at the very end. So as a destination, you can see the entry to, to uh, uh, Building B and the place of C. So, there's a, a lot of work to do, obviously, but and the and the buildings are demonstrated as buildings that comply and give us a starting point for determining the density and how many units we have, and then we're putting it on the ground and developing it from that point. So that's that's the drawing you see for building or page nine parking. That parking is the balance of when when we uh, park underneath the buildings uh, when depending on which way we go we can't park a hundred percent of the parking needed for the tenants 
so there's a few cars that are that are put outside say a two bedroom unit you need two cars so they flip a coin somebody gets the inside space and somebody gets the outside space but it's not bad so the the parking how much sort of overflow parking beyond what the residents will have is there uh, we've just accounted for the retail space yeah. in the front and some of back on the side so the answer to your question is is none you know we've we've provided for residential retail guests uh, but there's no uh, if you're if you're coming to the restaurant then those spaces are for you if, if it's a restaurant so that's how it's accounted for I think that answers the question it, it and is, is the parking on the on the I'm sorry the on the north road yep on the perimeter that's not for this facility that that's MBTA parking that's correct Right. Yeah. There is an opportunity potentially to share with the MBTA for uh -huh. hours because obviously they're not using that overnight. So if we, if we need yeah. additional spaces, we can certainly speak with them about that. Uh -huh. to that. Okay. Sharing is a good idea, tail until you get right down to the nitty gritty of who wants the space when. Commuters are you know all day long, uh, and and the when that can switch over to for the residents. You know the timing it will never be right you know when somebody wants to have the space so, so yeah I see, that, I see that I see that being used quite a bit not just for the train but for the, for the retail space yeah. Yeah. I don't think you're gonna be able to regulate that very well unless you had you know a definitive yeah barrier to it or something yeah mm -hmm. but you know it's it's just it's almost an unreasonable number of cars that the T is requiring because if you and look at this this uh, front photo, that's Mr. Google. That's the reality of the cars parked in there versus the ones across the street next to the platform. I mean, there, you, there's like 10, 15 cars. The only ones now is that the town uses for school buses up top, mm -hmm. and the cars up there are the drivers of the school buses. So it's kind of, I mean, it's a, it's a yeah, it works well for the schools. Brad, it's a, he wanted. Yes. Uh, no, I just if you guys want to look into a model for the shared parking concept, the MBTA at the Hingham Shipyard, yeah. that yeah. front lot they share at the marina. Right. You know, yeah. There's a, a customer there, but it works quite well. Yeah. So on the weekends they open that up, and I would assume at night they could do a similar thing. So at least for the retail and sharing concept, there's a model. They've talked that they only about about sharing, so I mean they're open to that. Um, and, and the, uh, the other thing that we were discussing was making sure that the three of the parking the top was that so it's easy for, them, easy for them to maintain and take care of. But uh, Jim's correct. I mean, on a daily basis, you don't see uh, uh, heavy demand on that part of the site that mm -hmm. they do right now by the station. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, nonetheless, you, you need to reserve the spaces. So if you can share with them for retail, I think we're fine. I, I think the other part is. Um, you know, as long as we have that sharing piece worked out, we can, in fact, if his guests coming in to visit someone, this should be in the pocket. I think if you know, we have in front of the, the units, uh, the apartments, and then what we have mm -hmm. around the stuff, so I think we're, we're comfortable with that. Um, what have you done so far, just thinking about infrastructure, water and sewer in particular? Um, do you have estimates for those? kinds of needs because those could be limiting factors here yes the answer I, I believe is no we haven't we're, we're trying to get the pieces all together and quantified uh, we're most likely going to use Greg Morse's company uh, engineering for uh, the uh, stormwater and the site civil work they seem to have a lot of good experience with the town kind of mm -hmm. doing a good job so That'd be a next I'm thinking step. more of water supply and wastewater yeah. discharge, yes. um, both of which are fairly constrained here in situate. And so mm -hmm. knowing what that is, and we're going through that now with other developments, right. trying to right. understand yeah. what our limiting factor is in town, um, that would be something that would be, we should look into. yeah, that we should have. And uh, in fact, we're looking at um, evaluating capacity in a, in a uh, more rigorous way than we have in the past, I think. 
on, on both water and sewer. So I think it would be good to have a clear understanding of what yeah. we would anticipate there. Right. Um, That's why we, we've taken this just to this conceptual level, but we can believe in the the quantities, the number of units, mm -hmm. and the and the you know what we're going to need for sewer and water. So we will have a better understanding of when now when we approach the town of what we're asking for. Uh, I think that that was an important part of this exercise. And I, I know you talked about a piece of this belong piece of the frontage belongs to the town. Mm -hmm. um, would you do something different if you had access to that frontage? Possibly. I mean, one of the things we might be able to do is take some of the parking that's right now shown in front of the retail and move it over by, uh, if, we had, if we had access to that, that could, that could change it. I think not, another idea was recently discussed is, is whether or not we can move the tree line back um, closer to the retail sort of trade. You know, if they take it off, off the street, possibly that, that might be an improvement. So we could, we'd, look at, we'd look at all of those. Things. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking more of bringing the retail closer yeah, to the street. Yeah. The retail to the street as well. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Because um, that's, that's a piece of what we've been trying to encourage in this particular district is to have, um, you know, sort of that street front feel to, yeah. Yeah. to this kind of development. Yeah. I think. Yeah. We thought long and hard about taking it as it is and making it work. And I guess at least I was convinced that when you drive through there, seeing the retail is really important, but then being able to get to it is important as well. So when we, when we uh, came up with the right number of retail parking places, it worked really well and, and they got buffered fairly well from the street. It's interesting though, if you, if you look at right now what we're showing you and what you're suggesting, if we pull this, if we could pull it closer to the, to um, basically uh, old driftway mm -hmm. from a sight line perspective coming to the corner and seeing down, mm -hmm. you'd, you'd see it, it would, bring, it would be more attractive. Mm -hmm. It would allow us, I think, to open up that space in the center and, and to have even more kind of common area up there for everyone. I mean, it'd be, mm -hmm. it'd be good to work on it all the way. So yeah, we'd love to be able to explore that. I think you could probably, excuse me, you could probably do that anyway, regardless, because you're going to landscape. I'm sure the town wouldn't mind the trees, mm -hmm. but my sense is the less pavement we have in front, because you end up, whether it's parallel or diagonal yeah. parking, people are going in six different directions and people are walking across that space to the retail, and you're going to end up with a problem. There are no crosswalks per se and people don't pay attention they really don't so if you could move everything forward mm -hmm. and then you could see it and when another company came in here I think it was Conway or Con someone yeah. and it was the same thing move it forward then you have more space between the back of this building and the one behind it that you can figure out the best way to put parking there right. and has the MBTA made any noise about uh, maybe the the um, parkers, might, the people parking back there, the hike. No one likes to walk. Right. They really don't. <laughs> you know, unless it's Christmas Nobody and really your parks out there anyway. I know, but then again, you know, unless it's Social Plaza or Christmas, no one's parking. Yeah. You know, they don't want to walk. Well, I think actually bringing the retail closer to the street also makes it, you know, it's. It's not a huge difference, but it makes it more sort of connected yes. to the train station, yes. where I would bet a lot of the people who've taken the train, if it was coffee or I, I don't know what it is, but you know, if it, if it were something they could, someplace they could sort of, you know, stop on the way to the train or on the way home, then also if, if we did, if, if if someone did have a restaurant, would take out or or, or a grocery, and they would take out whatnot. Moving closer to that park, to where the mm -hmm. parking really is, would be a big plus. And so then the, they'd be more apt to park in back mm -hmm. because they're walking through to get whatever right across the street to the train station and then coming back. Right. Or if they, as Jim pointed out, if they live in these apartments. The only other thing I would suggest from an aesthetic standpoint, 
I don't care for that round thing. It looks like a spaceship. <laughs> How about a carousel? Uh, whatever. <laughs> Those are friendly. There, there you go. But I think that you could come up with something that's a little bit more in keeping with situate, um, I know you can do it. <laughs> I'm, I'm certain that you can. If you put it that way. But just don't make it look like a ship, though. Really? No. I mean, it looks like it's about ready to go. So. No, I mean, it, a sailing ship. A sa no, don't do that either. No. no. I think that was up on one, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, at any rate, that would so, be yeah. move it forward and somehow figure out the spaceship. Well, so are you guys suggesting that how would we uh, would we go into the town and say, hey, we want to we want your land out in front, and we're going to change it and park on it and contour it? Yeah, and I think you should talk to the guy down at the right end mm -hmm. yeah, and right. talk yeah. about what's possible, yeah. right? Um, right? Just yeah. I, I wouldn't want to sort of limit my thinking here because what I'm thinking is this is the sort of corner, cornerstone of of the. The driftway area here, yes, and uh, you know, and I'm looking at the sidewalks and all of that, and saying, you know, we really should have kind of a, a standard kind of look and feel that we really want up and down the sidewalks as well. So, um, this is the time to be thinking a bit outside the yeah. box. This, this I, I'm not, I'm not committing that we can do it. No, no, and I'm, no, I'm no. going to leave it to Brad to sort of yeah. work through. Yeah, those particular just, issues and whether it's possible or not but it would seem to me that if it ultimately delivered you know a a, a better sort of look and feel and project then then we should be working together on that because that is such a small little piece of land right there now we have to make sure we have easements for infrastructure and all of that but yeah. Now, this That's is usually good, doable. Good timing. Because I was reticent to just jump on the town land and say, you know, John, we can do it. We can park any place we want, yeah. knowing that you can't. Mm -hmm. So well, that's why this informal but relevant conversation is good at this point. It's, I think it's very important that you don't have all of this pavement in front of these buildings, that we need. It's far more approachable. I know that it's up on a hill. And if there were stairs or ramps or whatever for people to have access, but you have the sidewalk and you don't have to be concerned about being run over. Well, I appreciate the comments that they've been very good. Yeah. I understand that. So, I mean, what, I, what we had discussed prior to the meeting is that you know you have that nice landscape buffer in front which is on the town owned piece but I think we'd want to avoid creating kind of an island where you can't see the thing right. there's no visual connection and right. while you rethink the parking you know in conjunction right. with the board's comments and the department's comments I wouldn't want to lose that pedestrian feel in between the buildings either so wherever you know parking may be relocated I think that concept of the pedestrian being kind of the, the dominant mm -hmm. force back there regardless mm -hmm. of how you know parking is accommodated so a theme that we'd like to yeah. Yeah. See, continue. What allows us to move things, if we move things forward, it's just, it's just suggesting, I think, it allows us much more freedom back here to figure out sort of how to make that yeah, it courtyard does. work at the same time. You know, it's a fairly tight space back. right now. Right. Right. It's it's true. Seems like, and, and it seems like you would, one part of that area has to be for service trucks and that kind right. of stuff. That would show yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, that, that could flip, that could ease, that could, that could ease. Am I right in looking, as I look at your kind of layout, that you are planning to do something on the main sidewalk? Is that? Which, which planning? I'm looking at five? Seven. seven. Looking at that. It looks like there's like brick walks. Is this, this is what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, you know, brick, no. Concrete pavers, colored, textured, yes. But replacing the existing town sidewalk? Or upgrading <coughs> the existing this is town? This an, ambi an ambitious wish, okay? Well, if, I don't think it's a bad the, idea. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we, if we had the, that town land that we could do it, then that'd be a natural. I think that's it. something that you, you might want to discuss. I'm gonna throw one other thing out that's a little bizarre. What if you switched building B with building A and maybe went up a little bit higher so that you have, if you're, you're doing a restaurant, you've mm -hmm. got that un, 
unbelievable view. Yeah. That Public if it, yeah. if you yeah. were yeah. switch them. Yeah. You would. You'd have a great view of that. Yeah. And you know, and that in and of itself is worth a lot. Yeah. Let's see this. Yes. Yeah. Even you know, next to the dog park, though. Okay. The dog park's way gone down. I'm guessing the dog park won't be there for a long time. Having a clue, but it's it's down past the golf course, right. so I wouldn't be the least bit concerned you're about that. I'm sorry, the kennel. No, the 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 oh, the kennel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, it, you know, if you have enough doggy money, yeah. right. doggy dig <laughs> for all the people that live in the apartments. That's right. Yeah. That Actually, will. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amenity. That's how we're going to sell it. There you go. <laughs> but no, it's it's just a thought. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That to somehow figure out a way, even if you were to take. The Take that bill, I'm rearranging your project for you, and put this down sort of in the back I see. so that you, you know, you're looking out mm -hmm. over the river yes. and what have you. Right. You're not interfering with doggy daycare. Mm -hmm. So it's a thought. Well, I think, I think the, the next steps, it, you know, kind of sketch out some of these ideas we're talking about, describing the the possibilities and the opportunities and then come back for another round uh, that would be fabulous because uh, the potential here is limitless yep. right. it yeah. really is limitless it this is going to be developed whether we want it to be or not mm -hmm. and I think it would be behoove us all to have a, a stake in it mm -hmm. and also we'll have many public hearings there's some public here now I don't know Stephen, if you want to ask them if they have anything they would like to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I just wanted to give everybody here to tell you that. Yeah. What, can I mention one thing? Sure. And that's on the, when you look at the aerial view, number seven, mm -hmm. uh, what we've done is we've had the, the, the modular footprint, B, C, and D. But because of the efficiency of having a shared uh, uh, elevator core as a as a link between the two we're showing a, a what here looks like a tower mm -hmm. that would be elevator and stair and it means that then the parking underneath both of those buildings is you don't have the uh, the stairs coming down in the core and the elevator coming down you can park underneath both buildings it's just clear meat mm -hmm. for parking and you just walk to the elevator shared in the center and we thought too that that might be a nice place to have some kind of a an amenity for the uh, apartment dwellers that might be um, a space they could meet, sit, open their mail. I mean, just kind of have an opportunity to meet one another if they're all living in the same same building. You're not you're not planning on like cordoning off one area or another. Is this still going to be sort of public? Walking space. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the idea was just to save that to make it save an elevator core, put part of the two more five or five spaces down below. I, get, I get that. Common core, and also use the use that ground floor is basically some seating so people could, if they as the, mm -hmm. Jim said they open it when they get in the meal, they open the meal, they get this place to sit, they can they can be. The idea is trying to make what we we're trying to do here, and I love, love the idea of coming close to the, the street here is. Is to, is to create a, a bit of a community in here so people do get to see each other. They can, if they, if they want to, and they, get, they can get together and have open mm -hmm. space and have some place where they can have a coffee and talk. So what's the uh, What's the little building in the back? Yeah, coffee shop. Sure. That's a coffee shop. That, that should be retail pulling in off. This is right here. Correct. Yes. That's a coffee shop. Yep. There's a. If you look on the plan, it does show the plan six. It does, it's a coffee shop. We did a oh, our okay. best guess at a way to have a, an order area and then around the side pick up for a for a drive through without uh, any Duncan impairment Donuts will on love the. You. <laughs> <laughs> That's where they could queue for the Dunkin' Donuts across the street. <laughs> Oh, it, 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 it works a couple of different ways. One is it, brings, it makes that entrance more attractive mm -hmm. to use the site, also for the team. So it, it sort of spreads the traffic around so, as well. It gives us a good retail location. Okay. What do you think uh, about the use for Building A? Um, uh, I guess the, the, the intuitive one was food court, food 
restaurant, deli, that kind of cafe. But can you think of other uses that might Well, my, my guess is, this is just a guess, but my guess is that, you know, in the, in the winter months, primary use is going to be mostly the residents and, you know, people using the train station. I mean, you know, because it'll be, it'll be limited traffic there, I would imagine, uh, unless there's a real, uh, you know, destination restaurant or something like that to go to. So I'm not really sure what you'd put in there from, a, I'll have to leave it up to you to figure out the retail stuff. Yeah, it's a, it's a key spot. It's kind of a fulcrum the way it is now. Well, the other thought, I had mentioned this to you, Jim. Yeah. Daycare. Pardon? Daycare. Daycare. If you yes. have a Horizons or something in there, yeah. which enables people who are taking the train to yeah. easily park the children along with the car and yeah. take the train, come back and pick them up. Perfect. And they can also do errands or whatever happens to be there. Mm -hmm. right. that's, a, that's a great idea. We did different talk kind about of that. retail. It wouldn't really be sort of a drop-in retail. No, no. But I mean, if you've got a food court there, a Trader Joe's or something like that, that they can grab something, mm -hmm. grab the child, and boom, up they're gone. I don't think it's really going to be a big enough retail space, is it, for a, like a grocery store right. right it would be a smaller yeah. market yeah, yeah. That and there's one down in the harbor anyway mm -hmm. so okay um other questions um well well one thing that i'd like to just point out too that, that just i'm thinking about the whole area is right now obviously it's a hundred percent bituminous um asphalt parking lot and it's kind of you know, I understand the parking's a necessity in MBTO and land end, but that also, it leaves a lot to be desired from a kind of visual as well as environmental ecological services perspective. So I'm just, I think it'd be good to kind of look in as you, as, as this starts to come together more, look in how to integrate um, like environmentally sensitive site design and low impact development to help actually mitigate some of the impacts from stormwater and the giant parking lot that are currently yep. there and make it fit in better with the to tr the character of the neighborhood. Uh, uh. Deal with the runoff and the rest of it. Yeah. yeah. Totally agree. Uh, and the, the other thing, I think it's kind of been discussed a little bit, but my, this was just a comment I wrote in my notes like when we were first talking about it, is just that there, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on driving in and driving out. Um, and you had mentioned that you want to try to come up with a concept that fits for the whole area, not just this development. So I think really exploring um, like walkability and accessibility and connection with other uh, you know, pedestrian or open space amenities, as well as other businesses within the Greenbush Greenbush district, um, would be really interesting to try to, like, from a holistic bird's eye view, how do we integrate some of these, uh, you know, walkability and connection kind of things? You know, I just like the idea of you know, somebody could come from Weymouth on the train for an afternoon, walk from walk to the yoga studio, take yoga class, walk to the brewery, get a beer go to the market and get dinner and just something that fosters that not not in design not necessarily on the idea that somebody's going in a car from point A to point B stopping here and there but kind of connecting things along you know that's I think that's terrific Ben also some type of connection with James Landing and Riverway those are two big residential areas that if it were used there is a, a, a walkway that goes down the driftway but somehow some way make it m more easily accessible crossing the street mm -hmm. plus you or also connect, have the golf connect, connect to it, right? connections we love connections yeah. connections but, uh, are a good thing just a question for you and I guess you guys have probably already thought about this but um, what do you how, how do you see the issue of the trains and the noise from the trains that, we have to worry about the windows, basically, and just uh, soundproofing. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, uh, you know, I, I, we're going to, uh, I think, just you're living next to the train, so I mean, I think that's that's either a plus, it's a big plus for commuting, and it's a big minus for noise. Yeah. 
So, but I do think. Well, particularly we, since it's the end of the. Where they idle up, right. they, they idle and they yeah. wait, things like that. So, yeah. so you, you have you have you have extra noise uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that, quite frankly, if we if we use we play with the, we work with the glass in, in soundproofing and whatnot, and certainly on closer to the train that side at least, I think we'll, we'll, we can get that mm -hmm. sound. Okay. Um, are there questions from the public? <coughs> yes, sir. Please yeah, identify yeah. yourself. And yeah, my name is David Gardy, 122 Gilson Road. I've been a resident for 40 years, over 40 years in this town, and I live up on Gilson Road. Uh, I'm a civil engineer. I, I don't have the advantage of having drawn before uh, this meeting, but I picked up a few points. Uh, Mr. Pritchard brought up one that was really concerning me about the infrastructure and the sewage treatment plan. I know there's been a, a lot of problems in the past with developments and trying to overtax what we had for the sewer system. They did uh, increase the capacity, and I, I don't know, I think there are still people, single-family homes that are in town that, that have been waiting to get on the sewage treatment plant. And uh, I worry about the fact that this type of development is going to prevent those people in town who have been here for a long time to get on the, on the plant. I wouldn't want to see that sort of uh, thing happen. Uh, I noticed that they get this uh, this uh, coffee shop, and I, if I read the plan right, that that's on the the, uh, uh, the driftway. I worry about a traffic study. Has anybody traffic done, done a traffic study on this relative to how many cars this is going to put on the road? Because right now I find uh, we get congestion at times down there. I even have trouble getting out of my out of Gilson Road on the mm -hmm. driftway, and sometimes I'm backed up. The circle of prime time when trains are coming and going. I just don't know if this is going to exacerbate that situation. Well, I could say there will most definitely be a traffic study required here. So I, I, my guess is you don't have one yet, but no. um, but that will absolutely be a requirement in this. And then uh, as part of the parking overflow in the MBTA, uh, I understand that they share a lot down at, uh, at the Hingham uh, commuter boat. Uh, I'm an MPT and I have wheelchair plates and every time I park in that water in the MPTA I'm tagged for money so I get a pay so I wonder what type of an arrangement they're going to have with, with tenants and having their friends or whatever park and they're going to run into a, a, a problem with that and from the point of view of not just um, the apartments being a success and making that arrangement I find a little deference in that fact that <laughs> that a private enterprise can need to use the parking lot that I have to pay for when I'm going in and using the train. I mean, if they can use it, why shouldn't I be able to use it and not to pay? It's a sort of an area, gray area that I wouldn't want to see cause a conflict between residents and the town and the MPTA. It's something that's got to be really looked at and identified how you, how you do let the tenants park there. Mm -hmm. And I take it these are rentals are not condominiums. Correct. In that case, I worry with the fact that the, the dog pound and they bark all the time and the trains on one side, the, the dog pound on the south side, the trains on the west side, and the citrus pipe on the north side. Uh, there's going to be an awful lot of noise, and I wonder if after a period of time, these apartments aren't going to seem so uh, uh, desirable, and you're going to run into a problem with renting, and it's going to turn into sort of a less than a desirable sort of piece of real estate in the town. Uh, I don't know if, how successful that would be, and I hate to see something turn into, situated into something different than what it is, what I've seen in the last 40 years. Uh, other than runoff uh, calculations and new C factors for the grounds and all the engineering, I, I, I know this is a conceptual plan, but I, would want, I want that to be looked at too. Uh, that's about all I have at this time. Right. Without any drawings, we're not even a preliminary plan. Yeah, this is an informal yeah, discussion. Yeah, not even a preliminary plan of my defendant. Most definitely, we would require <coughs> stormwater review and stormwater plans and I'll all the, sure I'm all back the stuff. Those. Maybe I can get a set of plans from the planning board before and help you with a review. Yeah. It will be all public documents. So. Free, free information, free mm -hmm. consulting. All right. Um, yes. Phyllis uh, Carlberg, 26 Hughes Road. Um, at the top of the picture up there, um, in the MBTA parking area that you have designated, the property that the town opted to not sell yes. with this with this project, mm -hmm. 
Is that going to be all right with the town to continue to use that for MBTA parking? Or, or how does that work with this particular plan when they decided to not let it go with the, you know? I mean, I think we had it. I think we had a deal with the MBTA that allowed them to use this parcel, right? If I remember right, they used this parcel and then we got a parcel over North Situate mm -hmm. somewhere. I, I think and that's it, but I... parking has to be in the back because they could use it for parking, but if it was for any other use, then it would not be appropriate. And that's why the parking is put up in the back? Well, that's that's why they're parking on our parcel back there. <laughs> right? That's I, what I mean, because yeah. that was the deal with the MBTA that it would have to use be used for only parking. I don't know the specifics of the deal, so I, I can't answer that. We could get the answer to that as part of this review. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, Elizabeth Chavang from 10 Jericho Road. Um, I like the idea of apartments so that our young folks can afford to stay in situate. And I like having it concentrated in one area. I am concerned about the parking. You know, Mill Wharf had only one parking space per unit, and if it's a three bedroom, it could be three adults living there that have three cars. And there really has to be enough parking for all of that. But more importantly is the sewer treatment plant and the um, access to water. We have drought conditions last year and water restrictions, so that really needs to be looked at. So those are my only concerns. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Well, I, I think we're we're already past <laughs> our appointed hour. Here. Um, hopefully, this has been helpful to to you. It's certainly been helpful to us to start to get a picture of what what's being proposed here. Um, and uh, I think you've heard a lot here today that you can take back and certainly stay in touch with Washburn. And, uh, and I would say, you know, in thinking about how this looks along the street, um, we should work together to, to make sure that um, we do the best job we can there because it's sort of a stranded parcel for us right now. Um, it, and I might add, as chairman of the Economic Development Commission, and I have, and Ted Bowes is here, he's our consultant, and that's one of the things that we have been looking at in terms of development in Greenbush. We've had visioning and, and so on. And I think people need to understand that the stakeholders, which are the property owners, which are the people, the residents, the businesses, everybody's going to be included in all of this. The, I am a firm believer in communication. And we will do that. And economic development will have workshops so it won't just be through the planning board it's also going to happen through EDC so um, we will put something together and right. go from there thank you right great one other thing just just struck me that I didn't ask um, are you going to eliminate the view of all these wires when you do this <laughs> hopefully Is the power going underground I mean to bury them internally for sure yes yeah, yeah. that becomes part yeah, of it yes yeah, that, on might the be, that might be something you want to think about in terms of just the look and feel. Because that's, that's pretty up. Um, just to add to your list. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank, I want to thank you really for your comments and, and for the community comments. So we'll take them all. <laughs> no, seriously. I'm glad you worry about me making money. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Sounds like they got free consulting. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Bill. Distinguished gentlemen, ladies. How are you? Tired. I think. Long days in you. Well, small day for Jen. Is Jen? No. Well, I, I had to be in a mass general. Yeah. And they moved me out. I got to be in a mass general about 4 to 8, 4 to 5. So I had to go over to Newton Laws to pick up Jen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
Jim, would you like a copy of this? Nope. Okay. Is this tantamount to 40 yard? I mean, we haven't accepted 40 yard. No. No, it's not a 40 no. yard. It's the village business overlay district. Yeah. Yeah. That's too bad. 40 yard is a good deal. You're right. If you recall, infrastructure was the infrastructure. Issue. The sewage certification right. was the one part that was lacking. Okay. So we're going to talk about the Greenbush Driftway Zone. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for having me. My name is Ted Brovitz. I am working with the EDC and with the town on some zoning initiatives, namely the uh, the Greenbush Driftway area. Uh, this is really a follow-up to the whole Greenbush Driftway visioning process that we went through for the last year or so. Well, and thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for waiting for a few minutes. Oh, <laughs> We're a little oh. late. <laughs> no, I enjoyed the I enjoyed the, the presentation. Um, so I've had a chance at this point to meet with EDC. We got a little bit of a delay here. We were supposed to get started uh, in the springtime, and there were some changes in town hall. So we uh, we just got started last month in working on the zoning. We've met with the EDC. I've met with Brad a few times. I had an opportunity to meet with the Drew Company just before this to talk about their ideas. Um, basically, what we're trying to do at this point is uh, translate more or less the conceptual ideas that are in the vision plan into some changes in the zoning. And it's necessary because the, the zoning in the Greenbush Driftway area is really confusing and convoluted. There's four different base districts, there's five different overlay districts, and in some cases they're really competing against each other. And specifically in the old Greenbush Village area and this new uh, Driftway area where we're looking at mixed use, and you've got the, the visual village business overlay district and you've got the general business and the commercial district so there's a real difference in terms of what the initial what the what the ideas are for those different zoning districts in the general business district for example there's a minimum setback of 30 feet and you're allowed to park in that first 30 feet in the VBOD the setback is limited to between 5 feet and 20 feet and you're not allowed to park in the in the front setback, so it would vary from parcel to parcel of what kind of you know what kind of development you might get. The VBOT is really is is really trying to get more walkable, pedestrian oriented mixed use districts, and that's what I think the overall vision plan is is talking about for not only the uh, the, the the area around the train station, but also the old the old uh, Greenbush Village. That at a, at a less moderate scale and then a little bit higher scale mixed use and density at the train station. Uh, but when you got two basically competing ordinances um, covering both areas, um, you've got a problem. So what my goal is to do is to try to take the best of both and you know maintaining the principles of mixed use and and walkability and creating these or, or you know uh, enhancing these these village centers. Um, and uh, and put together some new regulations, uh, and that'll involve uh, density requirements, uh, placement of buildings, placement of parking, uh, open space amenities, uh, streetscape amenities, and all the different things that are sort of cobbled together between the two different pe sets of zoning requirements. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that we're going to do is take the design standards that are at 750 right now and work those together with the design standards that are in the VBOD and make them consistent and put together some graphics so that people can see what's intended for those different types of uh, standards. Um, so that's really for the two areas, the key, the Greenbush area and the, and the, and the train station area. And then beyond that, we're looking sort of long term at going further down the driftway and what might happen uh, at the transfer station. Obviously that's a very nice piece of property. Um, the transfer station is a, a very large footprint use um, and if you look at other towns in the area in the South Shore, uh, they're using maybe a third of the amount of space uh, for the same functions. And you know, we're thinking maybe long term, at least in the vision plan, that there might be a possibility to relocate the transfer station which open up, would open up opportunities for reuse of that. That space is potentially as a business park uh, which the town could really use, you know, especially in close proximity to uh, Route 3 and the train station. 
um, and other sorts of um, you know, commercial opportunities. Going further down the driftway, we're looking at what might happen at Widow's Walk and the potential for maybe enhancing that space uh, with some you know, function space, some accommodations possibly, so we want to work that into uh, that particular area. Obviously, you know, maintaining the recreational nature of the property, but at least along the front edge, providing possibly the opportunity for accommodations and more function space. Mm -hmm. Um, on the south side, uh, in the area that where you have James Landing and you have um, uh, uh, Riverway, um, that's all zoned commercial with an overlay on top of it for planned residential development. So we would try to reestablish a base residential district that allowed you know sort of a little bit more moderate uh, residential to go in there uh, and take advantage of the views of the river, uh, take advantage of the of the proximity to the train station. Uh, I think it's got more potential for residential use on small on the small parcels that exist down there than it does for any kind of commercial use, which has no visibility uh, from the driftway. So that's where we are. My hope is that by this time next month, I will have a rough draft uh, to present to you and, and to get your developing feedback. Developing this draft, I am. You are uh, and, with and with Dotson and Flinker, with who, who? Dotson and Flinker, who who helped us with the okay. uh, vision plan. And as part of the, uh, the process, we are meeting with uh, property owners uh, and other stakeholders, residents, and so on. Mm -hmm. That'll be part of the process. Our goal is to have a full draft done by the end of November so we can work our way into public hearings and hopefully have it ready by uh, the Springtown meeting. And what is the, sort of what's the limit of sort of the scope of your, your visioning, if you will, in terms of you know, we were just talking about in terms of things like infrastructure, right? And in terms of things like, um, you know, you talk about residential on the south side, but you know, where do, does that? Are we looking at putting residential in places that are already in sort of harm's way from a environmental storm point of view, or, or from you know a sea level rise point of view? Are you looking at those kinds of yeah, as yeah. Well, as, as well, in addition to the, the use-based overlay districts like the planned development district, there are environmental overlays. So there's a recharge overlay and then there's a wetlands and floodplains overlay districts that cover those areas. Mm -hmm. So just like with James Landing and with uh, the Riverway, they had to go through the process of designing those spaces, those buildings, so that they, you know, they maintain the, uh, you know, they, they, they met those environmental standards. Um, I don't. I didn't anticipate doing any more than those two overlays, mm -hmm. uh, other than things that are already integrated into the uh, the VBOD, like uh, low impact design. So, for example, they allow for and they encourage you to do pervious pavers, um, narrow narrow travel lanes, shade trees, other other sort of tools that are used to treat the stormwater, the quantity and quality of stormwater on site, and not have to send it off site. So we would probably enhance that a little bit. And um, infrastructure? Yeah, as, as far as infrastructure goes, encourage and I mean, water sewer. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. Oh, about. water sewer, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, water and sewer. Are sewers. you addressing those at all? Or are you? I well, mean, it's, it's a great vision, but you know, that was the reason we ran into trouble with 40R. Is right. Couldn't com we couldn't commit to the we couldn't commit right? to the infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I and guess is that going to be part of this? I think that's something that Brad and I are going to have to talk about a little bit more. You know, how, you know, what's the overall master plan for the sewage treatment plant? I know there's issues with the, the wastewater treatment plant itself as well as the collection system, you know, II issues and then, you know, facility issues at the wastewater treatment plant. Right. You know, if there are other, if there are opportunities out there to maybe get some grant money to try to make some enhancements to it if there's matching. You know, there's other funding sources or resources that are out there that help us put together a better plan. So the visioning is really, though, not going to address infrastructure per se. In other words, sort of loading, additional loading on our existing infrastructure kind of thing. That's, that's not part of not Not, what not as part of the zoning yeah. part of this. But I did work with EDC over the last year putting together some analysis of, of the water and sewer and what that means in terms of economic development. And I think that's something we have to sort of vet out a little bit more what what can be done to help us. 
you know, I, address I, some of the well, issues. I think you have to address both water and sewer. Yeah, we do. Sewer. But uh, I think one of the, the points here, Steve, is we want to have these zoning things put into place. We want to have the design standards in place someday, hopefully in the near future the sewer and water situations will be resolved. And in the interim, if we have this zoning overlay meshed, we have design standards which we would need for 40R, if we have all of these pieces in place so that when this does happen, and it will eventually, we're not reacting to something, that we already have it in place so that we can go forward. Well, I, I, I hear you. I, I guess I also think of zoning as creating available development pressure, right? And we ought to be prepared to, to deal with that from an infrastructure supply point of view as well. And, and I just don't know from a town's point of view whether we are right now or not. Well, you've got the chicken and the egg. Which comes first? Well, you can zone it, but if you don't have infrastructure, right. it's then, not coming. Right? right? Um, so. I, yeah, I guess I'm saying let's not turn a blind eye to the notion that you know development takes a lot of support and and in a lot of different areas, but in particular in situate you know mm -hmm. sewer and water are big issues right and we shouldn't shouldn't ignore it. Mr. Hunt looks like he's. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just wondering when when did zoning become infrastructure dependent? It never has been, and it's not. Certainly not in the city of Boston. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, you know, it, it's one of those issues that, that you can zone for something, but yeah, yeah, forty R. You know, the reason we didn't do that is we didn't have the infrastructure for it. But that's, in my view, that was not a reason to withdraw it. That was an actual requirement of forty R. So we had to have the certification. Yep. From the sewer commissioners. Board of Selectmen. Well, there you go. There you go. But I guess my point, so, and you know, I can agree to we can agree to disagree. I, if we work forward with this zoning, eventually the rest of it will fall in place. I mean, one of the reasons why, when we had the opportunity years ago to sewer much of the town, the reaction was, well, we don't want to do that because all this land will become developable. Well, it's already been developed willy nilly. And, and I think the goal here is to ensure that when it is developed, it is done within a framework rather than piece. I don't disagree with that. Rather than piecemeal. And then it's. Right. it's no, we, we clearly understand that the water and sewer is a big issue. Absolutely, it's, without it's, question. It's really the linchpin for anything that happens down right. the Turfway. You know, we've done a vision plan for North Situate as well, and clearly, fully understanding that. Um, you know that we're two phases from getting there, which could be ten years or more. I mean, I could um, I'd be out of business. You got the tree streets in front of you. You've got issues to deal with in terms of the collection system and the and the plant. So, Steve, if I could for a sec, so I think it would be helpful to understand a full build out of what we could do now in the current zoning and how it would compare with this new zoning. Because I think there's a certain level of development you could do now as of right, which would bring up these same concerns. You know, mm -hmm. our own limitations. I think what, what Ted was trying to get at, you know, in terms of, you know, zoning, zoning certainly kind of unlocks the door, but it doesn't make the changes overnight. It allows potential changes. But what we need to consider is, you know, what can be the town investments and what can we go for terms, <coughs> in terms of state, you know, funding. There's MassWorks grants and other grant opportunities that have significant, uh, allow significant upgrades to your infrastructure that, you know, may be needed to facilitate some of these changes. Yeah. But, and, you know, the question is that, is that even uh, the challenge with changing zoning? I, I think it, and I like the the notion of trying to coordinate all of the zoning. Mm -hmm. But if you if you're creating additional build out capability, then you know we should be thinking about that from a some from a long range planning yeah. perspective, yeah. right? And yeah. and right now, you know, I don't know that we have the capability to to really assess that right now and. Um, it seems like we should at least understand what, when we're zoning, what we're, what sort of implication we're, we're bringing to the table <coughs> in terms of additional build-out and additional demands on town services, right? Uh, right. 
I mean, that, that would be a prudent thing to think about it. Yep. So That can be done, yes, for sure. Um, is, is what you're doing, so, so where are you, <coughs> how far are you going? Are you going up to the rotary? Yep. yep. Okay. And are you coming down, um, um, are you coming down Country Way? Are you mm -hmm. coming down that side yep. too? So, well, the one side of Country Way is residential. Right. So I'm not no, sure no, we're I'm about that. I'm not yeah. sure we're doing that, but we're no, going down to, to Old Country Way, yeah, yeah, Union Street, and that that triangle yeah. there, yeah. Whatever's covered by the the general business district and the in the VBOT, we'll, we're we're addressing that. Mm -hmm. And the visiting plan has a, a good map of the uh, proposed sub district, so I can send right. that around to the board. To right. Mm -hmm. So that area. The idea is to take go beyond the visioning plan, and you're trying to create actual actual zones, yeah. zones yeah. and standards within those zones. That's right. Right. That's right. And when you take say what graphical you, standards, actual pictures that we're going to integrate into. That's right. That you're proposing Graphic diagrams into right. the uh, right. bylaw. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That was something we Laura and I talked about, you know, a year or two ago. About yeah. Well, we've right. we've talked about that for years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Having you know, sort of a consistent look and feel. Uh, right. the, the whole district, if you will. So, right. yes, sir. Uh, James Hunt, Man on Road. Who commissioned this work? EDC or the planning board? EDC. EDC did, yeah. And who on the planning board is work? This is a zoning issue. Who on the planning board is working with the consultant? Nobody's working with the consultant. I mean, Anne's That's with the EDC, and well, we working with the town plan. I mean, we haven't seen. What, you, well, we're, what we're, you're proposing yet? We've seen the visioning, yeah, right. Yes. Um, so we're kind of at the next stage. Draft of rezoning in a, in a month and a half. What's that? You're talking. You're talking about presenting a draft zoning change in, in less than a month and a half. And I would think that I would think the board, or at least some members of the board, would be intimately involved in that. In that well, I'm hoping we get there at some point, but I, I have no idea what the schedule is, the plan is. You know what you're. What you're already, you know, kind of what you're. Well, we just, like I said, we just started. But the idea is that this is this is a follow-up directly of the vision plan, and in the vision plan, there's a very detailed, if you read it, action plan for zoning. So that's where we started from, and that's what I've been working on. So, you know, you will you'll get together, we'll put together a draft and present it to the planning board, and we'll be presenting it probably for the next several months. So the the, the planning board will. Will very much be involved in in, in vetting the pro vetting out the zoning and making adjustments as necessary. Yeah, I think the purpose of the draft yeah. is to have some actual thing to respond to. Yeah, um, yeah, it's pretty hard to do. I mean, I, that's why I'm here today. Is it's basically just giving you a heads up. I'm I'm just started working on it, mm -hmm. and I just want to let you know that, we're, you know, hopefully I have a rough draft by next next month to start mm -hmm. reviewing with you. Well, I think that it would be much preferred than sort of you know, having nothing to really sort of start with here, so. Right. Um, well, I think that was one of the issues of the 40Rs, that, that it was sort of put together so quickly and, and got the town meeting. I'm sure not a lot of people really understood what was going on with it. Just besides. Well, we yeah, we didn't really take it to town meeting. No. Right? We, we weren't we, able to. We sidetracked it before that because yeah. of one of the requirements was the, the really sewer. a commitment to infrastructure, right? Right. right, that we didn't have. So I'm writing a, I'm writing a 40R now for, uh, um, a community on the North Shore, and we've been with the, pl the, the planning board now, I think, 12 times. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 going to be that kind of process where yeah. we vet this out with the board, you know, in, in these kind of workshops, but also in public hearings. Gotcha. Um, so so just remind me of the schedule. It's going to be you say a month, month and a half. I'm hoping by this time next month I'll have a rough draft, and we can talk about the general ideas and principles and the, and the boundaries of the of the districts, and then you know that'll it'll be refined, and, and hopefully I can come back at least once a month, you know, in these types of workshops until we get to a point where we feel comfortable mm -hmm. uh, with it as a draft to present in public hearing. I mean, like I said, the the overall goal is to try to get something together for town meeting in the spring. And what's our schedule for town meeting in the spring? 
Like when usually would it? Warrant articles have to be submitted. Non-monetary articles have to usually be submitted early December. But we can always put we can, a placeholder. We can put placeholders in, but we're mm -hmm. going to be wanting to do, if you're talking about a couple of outreach uh, meetings, that they would be in January, and you'd have your hearing um, in like February, February yeah. and allow for at least one continuance. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, I'll run a time frame. Yeah. yeah, let's look at it. I, I'm, I'm not it's, sure how realistic the spring time meeting is, short. is, time is short. at this point. Well, yeah. unfortunately, we lost the summer for a number of different reasons. Well, we also have a lot of other things on our plate right now, mm -hmm. too. So mm -hmm. uh, some of the, these developments hope that it's yep. happen on top of everything else. So, um, But we should have an idea of what the sequencing mm -hmm. would have to be. Um, and again, I don't, I don't want to get into the situation where we feel like we're rushing through it either. Right. So no, we don't want to do that. Uh, so I don't know how, how realistic the spring town meeting is. But let's let's put. We'll the, see how it goes. I mean, I, let's yeah. put the timeline together. And I mean, if we can meet once a month be between good. now and, and the end of November and see where we are at that point, then we yeah. can get a better sense of if it's realistic or not to get to town meeting. But let's back up from town meeting and put right, our timeline together. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, any other questions? Um, I, this is just a logistics question. Is the EDC Greenbush Vision Plan available on the website? You know. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other question about that was: Is there an was I haven't had a chance to review that yet? Is there an analysis of uh, or a summary of the public visioning workshops like included yeah. in, in there? Okay. Actually, there's a separate document for that. There is. Okay. You had a full day back in early summer. We had a public workshop, and then we wrote a report on it. Okay. And show the results of it. Yeah. Is that and that's there as well. That's there as well. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And then there's a full analysis within the report, the visioning report about recommended zoning changes, and that's sort of our framework for going forward with this. Did you have an opportunity to, to look at the MBTA parcel? What they what they did. proposed? Yes, yeah. I did. Yeah. You did. Yep. Yeah. So. How does that fit into the, the vision so far? I think it's there's a lot of good things about it, and there's some issues, and you raised one of the, the main uh -huh. ones, was trying to bring things closer to the streets yeah. and make it more pedestrian-oriented, and that's a discussion that we had with them before, uh, mm -hmm. before this meeting. Um, first time I saw it. Conversation with the last developer, too. Yes, we did. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the idea was, I mean, we talked about this, is, you know, you've got that oversized green belt there that the town owns. Mm -hmm. You know that area could be reconfigured into more of a green. You know, it's sort of a, a, an active open space mm -hmm. for that for that train station area, and they could front right on that. You know, that would you know basically you know be a real asset to them as well as the people that are using train or live in the district, mm -hmm. and it frees up more space behind the building to reconfigure for parking. Yeah. So we we had the, sort of the same idea there. Um, I like the fact that I mean, in, in compared to the last plan. They did things that I would put in the zoning. For example, so that the buildings don't get too big, I would put a limit on the number of units in the building. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would have capped it at 24. That gives you a reasonably sized building without looking like a, a housing project. And that's exactly what they did. Yeah. Um, so I thought that part of it was good. I think that, you know, there's a general requirement for open space in the VBOD, 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and what I like to do in the zoning ordinance is define it you know what's it going to be it's got to be some active space whether it's on top of the roof or at grade mm -hmm. um, it's got to be a usable open space yeah. otherwise it's it's pretty well useless right. so well, I think they did a lot of drainage basins what's that can't be all the drainage basins can't be all the drainage yeah. basin right right <laughs> we don't want the kids in the drainage basin <laughs> so um, so I think there's some good things about it I really thought uh, it was a good start good. Yeah. Um, comments yes yeah, I checked the in 60 something way. Um, I know a lot of emphasis is put on driftway and old driftway because it's you see it. Yeah. But there's uh, old country way, Jenkins Place, yep. and Union Street. It's right. probably a quarter, not a third, of the old leaders district. Um, you really got to pay attention to that. I feel because yeah. a lot of housing can go in there. A lot, a lot can be developed. Mm -hmm. It's in the backyard, but it still can be developed as the rest of the. The only districts. Right. I really you think you should. Pay well, it. I want to meet with you. You're, you're on my list. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw the meeting. It's very developable, and I think it's a good 
think it can be done in a nice way. It's I think so too. And, 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 and I think there's, there's got to be distingu you know, distinctions between the old Greenbush Village and the train station. I mean, that's really, that's a different scale up there. And, and, and what you've got is a really nice fabric of an old, of well, an old we have a mixed station. use. And, and it's that's mixed what use. Trying right. To do. And right, exactly. I think you can do that without mm -hmm. over developing. Right. And I think and there's a lot of developing. The old Fitz's Mill can be, you know, a lot of property there. Absolutely. That's yeah. true. And I think that has to be paid attention to as much as you sold it. Well, we, we should get together because the concept plan it. shows just you know, moderate infill mixed use development, including the old face mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So I'd like to talk to you about that and how that translates into New Zealand. Right. And it's very historic. And I think we should hold that historic. Even yeah. the meeting we had before this, I think that the design for the building should be kept in line with the way it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, it's getting changed really quick. Yeah, I think we're at the point where we can pull back the reins. I think. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a true historic village. I mean, totally. unlike the train station, which is a big parking lot, and we're right. sort of starting from scratch. Right. And I think they so. they've got a great idea, but as long as they can design it properly, yeah. and uh, we need the development, we need the tax dollar, we need businesses, and I think it's the next next few you can do that. Well, I know where you live, so I, you know, if you want to meet next week, I'll come down and talk to you. Because you're on my list. <laughs> uh oh, you don't want to be on his list. <laughs> um, anybody else? Yes. Uh, Bob, well, a brand new 37 Stock Ridge Road. Uh, one quick question on the this rezoning of the reconfiguring of zones. Is it going to be. Uh, let me back up half a second. I went and made that workshop or presentation they had down at the Marine Center. Yeah, yeah. They showed all the pictures and all the what they like to do. Now, and they, they go out 50 years from now. Now, I don't have to worry about where I'm going to be 50 years from now. I'm going to live where some of the other do. But I am concerned about what's going to be going on in 50 years because I'm pretty sure that my family's going to want to live in the house that I'm living in now. And I don't want them to come down to situate and find it not like they expected. I'm not a I'm not a situate native, but my folks were situate natives. They both grew up in situate. They just happened to be my mother just happened to be one of the three Fitz kids that got married and moved out of town. But I have moved back here to retire, and I'm living in the family home on Stockbridge Road, and I saw that vision for 50 years from now in Greenbush. And I see, I'm trying to call it the dump. I see that move, and I see the road to the dump being my driveway now, is what is my driveway. And I don't see that in Situate's future, or Greenbush's future. Greenbush has a lot of history in it, and every time we do something by building a a three-unit thing that looks like a bunch of uh, double wides nailed together right now, just going up by the railroad bridge. It's, uh, I'm afraid that every time something like that is done, Situate and Greenbush in particular is losing a part of its history that goes back almost 400 years. And that's really something that I think we, we can't afford to lose that. We should never forget where we came from and you know what what we're made of. I feel like I have I feel I feel more passionate for Situate than I did for the town I grew up in, which was a decent town. I got a good education and it's in a revolutionary section up northeast of Boston. But I just feel that all this overdevelopment is is hurting the historical and the cultural advantages that we have in Situate. And I'm just speaking my piece like that every once in a while. Thank you. Thank you. I'm in concurrence with them. I remember this place in the 50s, it's all changed. I like the old Front Street, but I'm an old man. I'm 71. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think the things that attracted me to Situate, actually we used to boat here in the 50s, but when I moved here in the, in the, in the mid-70s, they seem to be all gone now. It's not, not the town I moved here to be in. 
you know. But I understand things change and progress, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. emanates, but I, I can understand his, his, his feelings, you know. We have to maintain that. That's what situates about. My other half at home, she was complaining the other night, you know, it's all these people moved down from Boston. They want to be out in the country, and then they want to change it. They want to make it look like where they came from. Is it progress, or do we lose something? Mm -hmm. Well, I think I do think you know one of the things we have the opportunity here is to help try to maintain at least that look and feel and the, and the, yeah. sort of the architecture of situate as we do these kinds of things. And um, you know, we there are probably you know development that we can't you know stop or you know there's there's probably ongoing activities that you know things change as you go along you know I'm, I'm sure in 1850 the place looked a hell of a lot different than 1950 you know so <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lindbergh remembers me coming in when they wanted to click out a big area on, on first parish road oh, I thought you were going to say he remembered 1850 <laughs> 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 no, 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 I, I grabbed a set of plans and made an evaluation for the town because they didn't like what they were doing you know like we're going to lose something, all the beautiful foliage. And I like to try and maintain something of the old situation. Great. Um, yeah, last, last comment, then we're going to move if there on. Was, if there is a district in, in situate that begs the rezoning, it's Greenbush. We struggled with that for years and years. We solved some immediate problems with the PDD, the Plan Development District. Uh, but those those problems are over overcome by events now, between Bobby Drew and Tottenham and Lu Lucian Russo and all of that on the on the east side of the driftway, it begs to be rezoned and it begs to be developed in an intelligent way. It is it is critical to our. Uh, to our very survival in terms of being able to afford the infrastructure improvements that are are coming down down the road. So I I, I think the effort is is right on point. I, I I read the EDC visioning thing now three times, and there are, I see some difficulties with it, but it's extremely well done in in my opinion. Um, this, aside from North Situate, which is particularly problematic, and we can deal with that later. Um, yeah, always later. <laughs> it's always later. Always later. It's always later. Always later. Right. Always later. Right. Always always later. Believe me, I grew up in North Situate. I came to Situate in 1944. That's the year I was born. Uh, Greenbush is, is, is critical to, to keeping it all together. As, as far as the plan development district goes, I think there's a problem there. I have a letter from the former zoning enforcement officer, my good friend Neil Duggan, who, mm. who claims that as an overlay district, commercial development in the PDDs is permitted as a matter of right because it's the underlying It's the underlying zone. Yeah. yeah. On the driftway. Now, the that's zone. not the way the PDD was originally drawn. Yeah, I, I wrote it. Um, that has to be dealt with if we don't go this route. Right. That would be dealt with as part of this. It's, it's got to be dealt yeah. with. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, it's really a balance between saving the historic character, particularly in the right. Greenbush Village. And, and, you know, development's going to happen one way or the other. So if we can shape development in a, in a pattern that's consistent with the particular characteristics in that village, that's important. But at the same time, take advantage of those other places you mentioned that are ripe for redevelopment, are going to redevelop some way or shape or form, and we need to be part of that process and make sure it's done intelligently. I, I, I can't stress it enough. It's absolutely, in my opinion, it's absolutely yeah. critical that this be done well, right. be done fairly quickly, right. and be done with the participation of all the stakeholders, right. including the residents and the, and, and the business right. whole, and the business people and, and the developers and so forth. Right. It's got to be, this has got to be a collaborative effort. Absolutely. For the very first time, Situate has to zone collaboratively. We've never been able to do that, yeah. ever. Well, I, I, you know, I do a lot of zoning, and if you don't do it collaboratively, you don't have a chance at town meeting.
If there's any doubt in anybody's mind, it just doesn't count. Yes. All right. And so I, I think, I think why isn't that thing working? <laughs> no, actually, all we need to do is have Chick Fag and turn on the fan and move some of this hot air around. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, one thing. Uh, the uh, charm of this town is the economic diversity of all people. And if we have, it's important to have this um, low income housing or affordable housing in the town in order to keep the, I think that's part of the charm of the town. We don't want all rich people, we want a nice diverse town. Okay. And all the people. <laughs> Good. On that note, we'll adjourn on this subject anyway. And we'll thank you for coming. Thank you. In. And we'll see look you next month. To, yeah, you seeing you next month. And Karen, will you'll put together a timeline for us as well? We'll put together a timeline with regards to a timeline and schedule it. Could you just everybody keep it down? <laughs> if you're gonna, if you want to talk. Please well, just talk outside in the hall. Since you canceled the December 28th meeting, are you willing to throw in a meeting the week before that so that you can still have two meetings in December? To Show us what it looks like. Okay. All right. And okay. then we'll. I, I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about everything that's going on and wondering how it's going to make tight. it all work. It's going to be tight, and, yeah. you know, we don't want to. We don't want to rush to. To judgment here, you know, because it's got to be fully thought out for town meeting, right? So, all right, sounds good. Okay, we're taking a five minute break. Record. It's not for the faint of heart. Um, I'm waiting six months because they told me to come back. So, I think we're going to have a little discussion about uh, kind of the master plan and how we tackle that fairly large challenge. <laughs> <laughs> so, you're up. Right. Um, so, in your packets, was a, it's just kind of a skeletal outline of what procedurally it would take and it's a little bit of content. Um, so I figured I'd just walk through this and we just kind of field questions as we go through. That makes sense. Um, so the first um, thing we need to do is get, I think, funding for this at the spring town meeting. Um, again, I think the department steer the train, but it's your train. So I think, you know, we would obviously be support staff all the way through. Um, and would, Again, kind of, kind of highlight our role in here, but obviously this is a planning board document. Mm -hmm. um, this is something the planning board endo endorses ultimately, and this is kind of your thing. So mm -hmm. um, again, anywhere you feel that you want to interject, please, please stop me. Um, so again, th these are th these are big efforts. Um, so I worked in the town of Easton. I, did, I, I had actually left before it started, but worked kind of the. A PR campaign, if you will, beforehand. We had a 1971 master plan, so it was almost 40 years old at the time. Um, but you know, worked to convince the, the planning board and other boards, uh -huh. committees of the public that this was a, a, an effort worth undertaking. Um, so Citroën's actually in pretty good shape. It's definitely outdated. It's 2004. Right. As a lot of you have noted, it, you know, it, it refers to things in the future that have already happened. Um, and given the, I think, the development pressures and other things that have happened, it, it makes sense to be working off of coordinated vision. Um, so, you know, as we can get into this later, it you know, breaks it down into topics. It's going to look and feel, I think, a lot like the one we have now, but with the current information. Um, so in, in order to get that going, you know, we would have to prepare a warrant article. We would perform all the necessary background research. Um, and obviously, any planning board member that wanted to participate, that'd be fine. But, you know, reaching out to potential firms before we're out on the street just to see who does this? What reasonably can we expect for our money? Mm -hmm. um, just get kind of a, a rough cost estimate for these things, just to see, just so we know what to expect and we know what to ask for. Um, again, you don't want to go overboard, but you don't want to ask for too little and not get the product that the town expects and the board expects. Um, and obviously, we do we know how much we spent on the last one? I don't. I can look okay. into that. You know. I guess we'd have to adjust it for 17 years or 13 right. years or whatever. <laughs> so I know when, when I was in Easton in 2010, yeah, the kind of 
ballpark figure, considering you weren't starting from scratch, was like 100,000. Okay. Um, so I put in here approximately 100 to 125. Again, we'll get better estimates. We'll get better sense mm -hmm. of what needs to be done to our plan to update it. Um, you know, certainly we have a lot of good inputs. So hopefully we'll, soon we will have a completed open space plan. We have a current housing production plan. So we have, you know, a lot of good things that can feed into this that hopefully can shave some of that down. Um, so, you know, assuming we're successful at the annual town meeting, we get funding. Um, following that, you know, we, we prepare and uh, issue the request for proposals to get that consultant assistance. Um, and then what I would like to see, what I'd like to have is a master plan selection committee. So kind of a group of folks that would review all the consultant proposals coming in and select, you know, based on the criteria and the RFP, the best, mm -hmm. best firm. Um, Again, so in here I have recommendations for who would serve on that, but clearly that's you know, up to you guys and that would be appropriate. So in the public procurement, you know, there's just timelines built in for how long the RFP has to be on the street. You know, we would need time to review it and then selecting. So realistically, probably it wouldn't be too late in that fall that we get someone on board. Um, once we actually, and, and the entire process, I think 12 months is very optimistic. I think 18 months is more realistic. Um, in that kind of, you know, we could even do this prior to the, the official kickoff when we get someone on board, but we want to form a master plan steering committee. Mm -hmm. um, and this would include representation from as many relevant boards and committees and departments as you see fit. You know, I, I would, we certainly want input from all, but I think to have a, a workable committee, maybe streamline the committee and have subcommittees to, to focus on thematic areas. Um, there's nothing harder than trying to you know, move a committee of 16 or 17 people, I think you'd want that to be representative of probably the most relevant boards, and then from there the subcommittees can talk about some of the details. Um, and again, some of the background information that the consultant would need to do is, you know, interviews with town departments, boards and committees, you know, business owners, residents, and that's kind of the initial footwork. Reviewing those existing plans that I talked about, existing policies. Um, reviewing a, a, a GIS map, the Geographic Information System map, just to get a bird's eye view of what's here now so we can evaluate our existing land use patterns and then kind of conceptually think about potential fu future build-out opportunities. And when I mean build-out, that means also conservation. That's just not, you know, tons of new buildings. It's what will the town look like, you know, with all the inputs and themes in this plan. Mm -hmm. When it comes to fruition, what do we want to see the town look like? Um, and this last bullet under that third section, I say conduct kickoff meeting listening session, but there's more information on the kind of public participation program below. Um, but that's kind of an initial meeting, kind of almost what we did tonight. It's, it's not that you, it's going to be the end all be all of the public process. You're more just kind of informing the public of what's to come and getting initial feedback on that overall process. Mm -hmm. uh, the master plan elements, so chapter MGL 81D, which is one of what statutory background for master plans actually clearly spells out the different elements that has to be in the different chapters if you will so all the master plans you see you know adopted throughout the state are going to at the minimum contain these sections um, and our existing master plan just just that so you have a section on the vision master plan goals land use housing economic development natural cultural and historic resources open space and recreation Public facilities and services, which we touched on a lot tonight, it's critical to all of these other pieces. Uh, transportation and circulation, and then so that this plan doesn't become, you know, something that just sits and collects dust, a implementation plan, and that may include zoning, it may include policy or other regulatory changes, um, etc. And what you're seeing now in a lot of master plans is a separate section on sustainability or climate resiliency. I would at least recommend to you folks that we not have that be a standalone but kind of thread that through the individual chapters because I think that's an overarching theme um, and I wouldn't want it to be a standalone that we kind of ignore as we address these other chapters. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, we're obviously right on the front line of this. We are indeed. <laughs> and so we need to sort of integrate it into mm -hmm. our thinking across the board. Um, in terms of public engagement, you know, I, I think more is better. I mean, we certainly have the initial kickoff listening session meetings, but, you know, holding multiple visioning workshops, um, you know, multiple different times so we can capture different audiences, nights, weekend format. Um, so, you know, open to suggestions on that. And then, you know, obviously multiple public meetings as we 
you know, when you present a draft, a draft is just that. It's not, this is final. It's just something for the, folk, for the public and others to react to. Mm -hmm. So the intention of that document is to gain as much feedback as you can on that so that you can make the modification so that when you finally get to the final plan, it's you know, representative of, of everyone's feedback. Um, and then, again, multiple meetings to present and get input on the final plan. So with that all said and done, again, I think probably much closer to the 18-month mark. Um, it would be finally endorsed by the planning board and, and whatever you know, town meeting proceeds that would be adopted at the annual town meeting. So again, this is just a skeletal outline, um, but I just wanted to give you folks kind of timing and content of what might go into this and some of the, the legwork by the department and commitments that would be needed by the board and other boards and committees in town. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, you know, if, if we got funding in April of 2018, we're probably talking that annual town meeting of 2020 yeah, to for you know adoption. Mm -hmm. That's a long process, isn't it? It's an arduous process, yeah. but well, it can be. It, it's a lot of work, and I remember one public meeting we had was over at the gym and we set up these different stations for the different um, elements and people would go through and we'd write down what they thought they wanted and it's we had um, if and Jim might be able to uh, speak to this as well we had an initial plan that was written back in, in the 70s it was never adopted by town meeting. The one in 04, finally, we had a plan adopted. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, no. We had them written, but they were never. Well, I don't think any one of you was affected uh, maybe. So, um, it was a process there. Right. How much of what you've laid out here, Brad, is, is sort of starting over as opposed to taking the current plan? and then saying, okay, here's what the current plan currently integrates, mm -hmm. and there are obviously areas that need to be updated, so to speak. I mean, I'm, I'm envisioning that's kind of how we're going to do this, right, is that we're going to start with the, at the baseline of the plan that was adopted in 2004. Unless there are more current documents as the soon-to-be-completed open space plan, the 2000. 14 or 15 housing plan. So again, not that that can't be kind of updated in this vision, but yes, yeah, yeah. something that hasn't been touched since that 2004 document, that would be kind of the, the baseline for at least discussion. Well, I would, I would assume that that whole thing is the baseline, and then if there's an open space plan, I would assume that, and I have to admit, I have to go back and read all this again, but I would assume we addressed open space in 2004 to the extent that the open space plan is sort of an implementation of what we identified in 2004, then I can see how we can adopt that, you know. Um, but it seems like if we use the baseline of what, of the original plan and say, I just don't want to go back to like square zero. No, 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 I think it's, it's not a, a lot ground of zero kind of thing, right? Yeah. It's, it's updating the plan that we all envisioned back in 2004 and saying, you know, 15, 20 years later, what, you know, what's the next 20 years going to look like in situate, right? What are the yep. next 40 years really going to look like in situate? Uh, I think with a typical shelf life of a master plan of 10 years, I think that's the very intention, is that you had a good basis and you're really providing updates to those different sections. Back then we didn't have the train and we were just getting involved with um, community preservation. So, right. you know, a number of different things have changed over the last... Right. We didn't have a golf course back then, did we? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, we did. It started we in the mid-90s. Paid, paid off the golf course. Over okay, 92. Yeah. 92. Mm -hmm. Is that right? No, I think it was later than that, Jim. No, it was later, I, it was the later than that. My and I was in, like, late 90s, right? What? No, it was mid. Yeah. Over 1992. Yeah. No. Really? I was on the planning board in 93 to 97, and that's when they came through for the permitting at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Because that was yes. in 92. Right. And it. 27. 24 years. 97. 97. Yeah. I thought they okay. just did 
did their 20 year bond last year. Oh, they rebonded it in year 16. It's been 24 years. Right, well, I, I don't want to dwell on that one. <laughs> no. So, um, <laughs> anyway, what, what do you what do y'all think? Um, no, I think it's great. The time is right to do it. I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel, obviously, like you were just getting at. But uh, I think one thing we should do is uh, obviously the public engagement piece of this is incredibly important. And I'm sure, you know, when we're vetting RFPs, we'll look at, you know, their experience with, you know, engaging communities and um, like survey instruments and methodologies and things like that. Um, so I think that that will be a big, big part of it. Um, and uh, and then and then the other thing is obviously you you stress the importance of the implementation and how do we give this fancy document some some teeth so that can be followed through on. I think those are my biggest um, things that I that I see here. Yeah, the process works. It's not unlike what we did in 04. I guess I did in 04. I was there too. What we did in 04. What we did in 04. <laughs> <laughs> and that, the one thing that, that we found, at least I found, was that it was also easy to, on the agenda to sit there and move that block from one meeting to the next meeting. Because you came back up and it came 10.35 or 10.45 or 10.11 11 o'clock. Rather than spend the time to do it, we just moved the, moved the block off. We need to make sure that we've got the, the willingness and the commitment to spend the time that's necessary to do it. Mm -hmm. And to come back up and adhere to a master schedule, a master plan. And, and the other thing I think we need to look at, and I'll try and pursue it with um, Social Coalition vis a vis MAPC money mm -hmm. from them. Well, that would be a good question to get answered before we. Oh, it across will be. Town meeting. I think I'd, I'd like to answer. Bill's question first, which is, you know, basically you're looking at where a lot of the lion's share of the efforts going to fall, right? and the question is, are you all prepared to do it? We have to do it. I'm prepared to do it, but you know, it's a it's a very good question so, I mean, because it takes a lot of work. Yeah, the consult. I mean, the consultant assistance is really to run the public workshops, prepare drafts, but we do need input on those drafts. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's going to be you know public yeah. meetings and hearings for the board. Yeah. Yeah. But it needs a strong sense of direction from the board. In other words, one person's mind think, mindset, working with, re, let's say, public resources, right, may, may send them off in the wrong direction. So I think we need to be, as a board, consistent with what our view is so that we can present that to the people that are coordinating all of the... We need to have our own mission statement before we go off doing something else. Well, I, I, I think we have. A very good stake in the ground, right? We've got the 2004 plan, so you know it, it's probably, and maybe that's a part of kind of our first effort is for us to look at the 2004 plan and just sort of flag where um, you know where there are gaps or holes, basically, or, or you know things have happened and we need to you know we might need to um, address particular areas of the plan more than others. Uh, yeah, but there's, there's still a void in the old plan, the old four plan, and that comes back to our water and our sewer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's that was the rock that we had to continually work around. We never managed to break. I, well, I think we're still trying to do that right now with yeah. every single development that comes through here. Right. Yeah. And I think, as, as you stated very eloquently, what we do depends on our ability to be able to provide that infrastructure. We need a commitment to do it. I mean, we saw, we saw where 40 R fell down. Yeah. And then that, it really wasn't a commitment. It had to sit, it was just gut level sitting there saying the, the capacity is available. Right. right. It, well, I mean, basically, it was people saying, we don't know if the capacity is available. Right? I mean, that's what it came down to. But it's always convenient because the board always managed to find a number when they needed a number to go one way or the other. Right. But when you need a number to plan, you never got it. Ever. Okay, well, I, I for one, like this structure myself. And yep. I think it sounds like the right structure. I think it's spot on. Yep. Yeah. Good job. And, uh, you know, I, 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 would, I would support taking this next step so that we're heading towards the, you know, the, 
2018 town meeting to request funding for this. Um, and so the, the question is, what do we need to do at this, at this point to get to that particular milestone? Any sense? Well, I mean, I think we need to build internal support among the other boards and committees, just kind of uh, socialize this concept, if you will, uh, and then doing our homework in terms of what, where this would go, how it would kind of update our, or build on the 2004 plan. So I think educating ourselves in that way first and then kind of socializing that concept of mm -hmm. why this is necessary um, would be kind of a, you know, getting another, I can do this, getting another folks' agendas of board members would like to join, that would be great, um, and just kind of letting folks know this is our intention. Yeah, and we're going to need your support as well. I think one of the first things we need to do is get the support of the Board of Selectmen, mm -hmm. or we're not going to get anywhere fast. Mm -hmm. They need to understand that this is what we need to do. And uh, it's necessary, and how do they feel about it? Yeah. But you need a commitment. I mean, the Board's going to sit there and say, yes, we need to update the master plan. Well, but we want a commitment from them. Yeah. And they have to sell some of that in advance, too. Pretty hard to deny updating a 13-year-old master plan. No. Well, we need the resources to do it, right? And, right. and the investment of time mm -hmm. to do it as well. Um, all right, well, let's, um, maybe we should circle back and sort of figure out how we how we address this in the next month or two so we can uh, target this uh, just a question for you on the on the warrant article is that is this not something that could just be plugged into the city budget do we, need, do we need a warrant article to do this i mean the money would have to come from i mean typically if it's not already budgeted a separate article, but it could be built into a uh -huh. future FY budget. It would seem like it needs to be. I don't know where it gets plugged in. I'm not familiar enough with the, the budget, but that's a you know good question to ask. Um. I'm doing that now, looking at what the impact on each department is in terms of how much money they're going to commit in their budget. I think you're better off keeping it as a separate entity. Better off uh, in that way. There, that the voter be better off doing it as a warrant article. As a warrant saying? officer, yeah. or a warrant article. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's see if we can start putting the <laughs> wheels in motion to get there. Then okay. um, I think we should just circle back and try to figure out how we. Because I do think talking to board selectmen would be a good first step, you know, to, to really get a sense for um, for the level of support to do this. Um, we certainly want all of the town board sort of on board that this is a, this is an effort that we ought to go through and we ought to ought to update the master plan. So. Suggestion? Did you ask for time on their next agenda and, and present it as a as a milestone, and a goal with a milestone? And that way you'll get some publicity and people will start to hear about it. Yeah. Well, I, I do think it needs to be on an agenda. I don't know if it's the next one, but well, you know, one of the next know, couple of agendas. Sooner agendas. rather than later. Yeah. And Widow's Walk was approved by town meeting and bonded in 92. It didn't open until 97. I knew there was nobody playing golf there. Good night. <laughs> 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 okay. Yes. That's okay. I was, I was going to continue with the golf course and I decided against it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thanks for putting this together, Brad. And, no, thank you for your Let's see if we can move it along. Um, discussion on zoning initiatives. Didn't we sort of just do that? Well, are there any other open initiatives that we want to discuss at this point? I mean, we are kind of running. 
you have to decide if the priority is going to be Greenbush or is there anything else you want to, that you think is that important, more important or as important as Greenbush to try to work on for uh, April Town Meeting? Seems like Greenbush is the top priority. That's going to be a big one, so I'd, I'd probably prefer not to muddy the water with other things unless we think there was a pressing issue here. And I don't, you know, we could go back and try the whole thing with the, uh, uh, with the accessory dwelling again. I was just thinking that, <laughs> and have my hat handed to me again at 2.30 in the morning. How no, wonderful. Not on my watch. Uh, yeah. I, I think rat tails are more important than accessory Oh, I hate dwellings. rat tails. But I, again, I would think that the Greenbush zoning is Yeah, and I think um, whether we make the annual town meeting or not, I think it might be distracting to have too many things in play right now. And I think, at least personally speaking, I, mean, I would want some time to see how other issues are popping up with the existing bylaws before we make recommendations to the board on potential future changes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's already lots of experience with how things are working or not, um, but I would like the opportunity to kind of better familiarize myself with how that's going on before we tackle those with the board. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think that one thing that Karen points out and that we discussed ad nauseum is, is, you know, this fancy design of lots that creates all these, you know, 10-foot property boundaries. <laughs> um, but I, I would prefer, I guess myself, I'd prefer if we're going to, if we really are going to try to address Greenbush at this town meeting, then that may just muddy the water. Um, yeah, I think the longer you defer Greenbush, the greater the chance of things happening down here that you'd you never coordinate. Right, that you don't want to. Yeah. I, I also think it's because you, EDC has done the visioning workshops and already the public, you know, there's some chatter and momentum going amongst the public. It's it's important to capitalize on that and like keep the, keep the ball rolling so it doesn't uh, get kind of forgotten about and people get delusioned with you know, participating in the dis disillusion with participating in the process and, and things like that. So, if it would be helpful, we could start a kind of a running list of housekeeping items, you know, whether big or small, and that could at least be then we'd have a menu for future changes. And maybe that could be a whole town meeting at one point, it would be just these kind of housekeeping oddball changes rather than, um, I don't know, just a thought. It's a good one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's good to keep a running list, I think. The more of those you put together on one town meeting floor, the more com more convoluted. It. Yeah, people get confused about it pretty quickly. So yeah. uh, we're probably better off looking at that list and saying, let's Which tackle. Which two do we want to do? The, yeah. the one or two that really we we ought to tackle. You know, so, but I think the the, the lot shape issue and, and the rat tail are, oh. that's definitely on our list. I think we've all decided we're going to let the uh, accessory dwelling issue dwell somewhere else for now. Play live for a while. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, anything else on zoning issues? All right. Can I, I, can I make a request? Yes, that, sir. That you engage in some public relations effort to explain the village business overlay situation, particularly with regard to the new construction that's going on down there right now. It, there's a lot of, a huge amount of misunderstanding about how that, how that came about, how it was permitted and so forth. And I don't, I don't think, I don't think a lot of people really understand how that happened. And, and, and they voted for it, but mm -hmm. of course, 250 people voted for it. I, 14,000 they could have. And so there's, there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding. It's one of the reasons I'm here. They, they, people call me on the phone and ask me, how did that happen? I said, well, come on. You know, you need to come here and ask those questions. But I think if you, if you guys could reach out a little bit, and now that you have a planning, you know, planning and development director that has access to public relations, then instrument and we have a website I, I just think that needs to be clarified 
because there's a tremendous amount of misunderstanding there. Somebody we, got away we, with something. Somebody Nobody did. Something? No, they didn't. Well, that's, that's what it After 13 public hearings. <laughs> you, you can have, you can have all the Have we had a lot of world. questions on that? No. Coming I mean, to the not, not to planning the planning, office? No, no, but I, I mean, there were 13 public hearings. We haven't yeah, currently had any questions yeah. Um, yeah. coming to the office. But I would the ask her, people in the office are more questioning when you see when you saw all the uh, the mobile the prefab units being staged down the street. Right. I mean, we're the ones who raised the questions, mm -hmm. but I mean, we haven't had any questions. Oh, that's hmm. and some of it's pretty nasty. It doesn't, sure. need to, it doesn't need to be nasty. No, no, no. But I, I would submit, Jim, that your questions are probably the same as mine, or from someone who doesn't attend a meeting. Probably, unless there's a major item that's going to impact them, doesn't go to town meeting yet. But yet, everything is big and ugly, and they don't like it. But I don't, I don't think they appreciated the the major, the major of that major item. You know, all of a sudden, morning glories and and Dave Ford's office turns into you know three giant buildings yeah. and people don't understand how that happens well it wasn't all of a sudden that's for sure no no and, and, and i knew what was going on five took, years took many years yeah. yes i didn't so. have gray hair when we started that <laughs> chris ford not dave ford chris chris, chris. but you well, know we'll, we'll we'll think about that but um well, one of the one of the ta candidates you know said the other night that he was talking about a monthly newsletter and that is an ideal vehicle for department heads and, and, and boards through the department heads to reach out to the public and, and keep the public in the in the know and if Ruth Thompson can't do it but she only reaches you know 2300 people well I Dare say even a month a monthly newsletter is only going to reach a certain well, percentage. Well, some money on postage, no. I'm not sure we're going to. I mean, we might do an electronic newsletter or something, but not everyone does electronics. Yeah. No, they don't. But they okay. do know when they don't like something. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's move on. The county. Do we have another county? The narrative here. Okay. Um, I move to approve the requisition of three hundred and eighty dollars to the American Planning Association for membership dues for Brad Washburn for two hundred and seventy-seven and thirty-eight to seventy dollars and thirty-eight cents. Sorry, to Gatehouse Media for legal advertisements in the Situate Mariner. For seventy-four dollars and thirty-five cents to Amory Engineers for construction inspections for thirteen Ford Place, for eight hundred and forty-five dollars to Merrill Corporation for engineering peer review and site inspections for five twenty-nine to five thirty-one Country Way, for twenty-three dollars to Schwab Incorporated for nameplates and for thirteen thousand seventy-three dollars and six cents to Horsley Witten for engineering peer review for Seaside at Situate Toll Brothers. Second. Yep. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we have, I think it's okay, we have additional monies from Toll Brothers? Yes, so we, we have, have 25000 Okay. Um, okay, any minutes at this point? Liaison reports. <laughs> Anybody? Um, CPC. We had a um, meeting, I th it's all, I should write some of this stuff down. <laughs> just filing. It's just filing, really. But um, we're going forward, I believe, with the second phase of the Situate Housing Central Park, windows on the second floor, um, parking and trails. There's a question about a map and what does it have to do with situate when it's about Maine. A few other things. That's about it. And then ADC, as you know, we're, we're still going forward and trying to figure out zoning and visioning mm -hmm. for Greenbush. Okay. Um, I note that we have the liaison list. 
update that list? Yes, that was the intent. You have a new um, associate member. Of course, we don't have Richard here. Mm -hmm. Why don't we, um, I, I hate to put it off one more time, but let's wait till we get Richard here so we have everybody. Okay. Okay. He's, he's at the next meeting? He hasn't said he's not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, okay. I hope so because we'll give him one chance. I hope so because it's cool, brothers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The next meeting is as well. Yeah. Um, planning development updates. It's one good well, one. The first update is that we have a new director of planning, right? No, I was here last week. Yeah, he was no. here. Uh, new town planner. Town planner. Town planner. I'm sorry. Town planner. I haven't ever placed Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> well, in such what you find out a month after the fact, anyway. No, I, I, um, so, congratulations, yeah. Karen. Thank very, you. Very, very well. Welcome, 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 welcome. And I'd like to take a second, just real quick. Karen's been extremely helpful, most helpful in getting me kind of situated in the first month or so that I've been here. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be what I'm doing right now without Karen. So, I'm very excited, and she has a great background in planning. Um, just really knows her stuff, so I'm you know, super excited to have Karen on board, and then you know we're going to be posting uh, to backfill her position shortly, so we'll be fully yeah. staffed, and that's exciting too. Yeah. So we can mm -hmm. all focus on what we need to be doing. I think I said this to Karen, but I think that's her top priority. <laughs> <laughs> she needs help. She's motivated. Right? <laughs> um, other? Did you have any other issues you wanted to raise? I have a few. Just. Uh, Planning yeah, I have a few. Okay, let me let me go. I'll, I'll briefly, I sent everybody, or Karen sent everybody today, just some minutes from a meeting I had with the uh, water department on Tuesday, I guess it was. And what sort of motiv made, motivated me to do that was to understand how we are making capacity decisions with respect to new developments and. Um, the, the sort of the one analysis I saw to me was was at such a high level it couldn't possibly sort of answer the question do we really have the capacity or not it was just what's our annual average this year versus last year kind of thing and it doesn't really sort of address um, you know what is the real capacity of the situable water system so we had a very good meeting Brad was there um, Kevin Cafferty and um, Sean um, Anderson was there and um, we had a great discussion and one of the things I think we sort of settled on I hope is that we ought to take a different approach and have and sort of articulate a standard capacity analysis that we're going to do to add new capacity as we look for development and you'll see that I sort of took the liberty of sort of um, laying that out a little bit in terms of how we ought to think about it, but that we ought to think about it in terms of what are the what are kind of what's a stress year that we should look at and what's and what are the stressful months on the water system and then how do we how do we evaluate that against all of the criteria that um, we should be conforming to in our water permit, including you know fish ladder stream discharges out of the reservoir, all of those issues. Um, um, we sort of said we should build a methodology that we use for assessing any new development, basically, that we're, we're going to add to the situate water system. I would dare say that we ought to sort of repeat that process for the wastewater side as well. But um, my primary concern was the fact that we have these big developments coming in. I mean, we just talked to somebody today about MBTA. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we have Toll Brothers. Um, <clears throat> and you know, we went through a, a pretty severe drought in 2016, and we should have an idea of where that line is, if you will, and uh, and then assess additional um, additional capacity re requests against that, essentially, and try to keep that as sort of the standard approach. Um, there's a lot of nuances in all of this, and I'm sure there's a ways to go, but one of the things that the water department said they would do is they would have, they would talk to Weston and Sampson, who was their outside consulting engineer, 
about how could they do this for, um, for, for you know, sort of implement this initial process, if you will, for the Toll Brothers development. Um, so they're they're actually asking the, the engineers now if if they can put together uh, an analysis for that. But then it occurred to me, well, we also have Ann Vinyl kind of on the list too, so maybe we ought to put both of those together because um, it all followed the same sort of methodology. So that was that was a piece of the conversation. The other piece was really about how do we help the, um, the water department sort of uh, modernize the way they do these things because they, they really don't have much in the way of tools to help them do this. Mm -hmm. They don't have a real sort of um, dynamic system map of, of the water system. They don't have any real uh, remote control or monitoring or data access. What they really have is just sort of dial up trouble alarms like your engine light, you know. Um, so they're pretty far, they're pretty far down the curve in terms of, you know, sort of modernizing the system. And so, you know, one of the things that, that um, we discussed is just providing support to help them get to that place where they start to modernize and they, they get it, they get a uh, GIS map of the system, right, and then they convert that into a hydraulic model so they actually have a way of analyzing how how new connections to the system impact the system. Because the other sort of second level conversation was was beyond capacity. It was now once you determine you're going to hook somebody up, what's the impact when you hook them up? Um, and not just the impact to the developer, but what's the impact to everybody else kind of down the line? How does it impact the system pressures and flows and, and all of that? And they, they have a bit of a, um, they have sort of a gross level test that they do, a hydraulic test that they do, um, but they probably need to take it up to another level to really understand whether a develop, particularly a development like this, um, you know, like Toll Brothers or like the MBTA is going to have localized problems in their system as well as, you know, you know, not to not to talk about the capacity issues at all, but just you know, how does the system perform as you add you know a giant a giant straw somewhere on the system? It'll change the performance of it. So, well, what are we talking in terms of bringing them up to uh, 2017? I mean, how are we going to modernize that? Modernize them? It sounds to me like they need either more help and or money. Yeah, it's good to ask. They need, they need that. Uh, and I think, I think one of the issues was, you know, at least to identify that modernization is uh, a relevant capital project mm -hmm. and that we ought to get it on the books and we ought to start down that road. Uh, I think really what they've faced so far is, you know, replacing water mains and doing these other things. They just, you know, the, the, the system work that you need to modernize keeps getting put further and further down the road. And also the maintenance gets put further and further down the road. Well, I think they try to address the maintenance before they address, you know, sort of these, you know, it, it, it goes into this whole thing about they're putting out fires instead of doing fire prevention, right? Well, you need to do a little both. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, I'm sort of just saying, you know, we're supportive of you moving in the direction of a more modern system that that you can really understand how it performs, right? And you can answer those questions of, you know, can we add 142 townhomes? Can we add 75? So how do we get a capital improvement for the water department on the warrant? Because this is incredibly important mm -hmm. for April. Right. And, and it, who well, do we talk to about this? Well, we had Kep in, in the meeting, so my understanding is he's going to put this together as part of the capital budget request, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if they want us to come and talk about supporting it, I'd be happy to do that. Mm -hmm. I think we would be Absolutely. all happy to do yes. that, right? Um, it's something that's long overdue. But I, th I do think they've got a lot of capital needs, and the only thing I don't want to have happen is that all of these other capital needs sort of drown out this this effort to move from the 19th century 
but one to the of, 21st. I understand, <laughs> but one of the, the, the issues that we have, the public, the residents, are complaining that how, you know, because they read in the paper about water restrictions and mm -hmm. all the rest of it, and yet, as you're saying, they're going to, there are other needs. This need to modernize our water department should take precedent in terms of future development, in terms of where yeah. we're going as a town. It's not something that can be just be shoved well, aside. I, I think we were sort of all in agreement in that meeting where we talked about that is that that needs to have precedent, but you know, regardless, you have to do things in parallel. You can't do that to the to you to to ignoring other things that are going on. You just have to raise the priority to a place where you will do this in parallel to doing that, right? And you, you need to identify the resources it takes to do it, um, which include you know getting beyond just you know putting in more modern controls, putting in you know having their system sort of already modeled, having a, a hydraulic model for their system, but it also includes you know, trying to get the town to the place where they have all of the smart water meters mm -hmm. in place because that's going to help them do things that they need to do against their water permit. Right now, the the uh, unidentified unidentified water loss is at 15 or 16 percent. Right? That's a and, lot. And the permit says, you know, two out of the next three years we need to be at 10 percent. Um, so, you know, and that's really the goal for the DEP is to have town at 10 percent, right? So, so there are a lot of things that they're trying to accomplish, um, and part of what you need to do that, I think, in this day and age is, is a lot more information about how your system's performing on a sort of day-to-day -day basis. Um, this is a good conversation, and I thought there were a lot of um, good ideas there. One of the things I said that we could do you know, in terms of conserving water is we, we should address that during development, right? Not just do you have a water connection and can you, is there the capacity there, but what are you doing about water conservation in the development? Low right? flow, flow toilets. Low flow toilets, low flow shower heads, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that ought to be kind of on our list, you know. Irrigate with the gray water or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I mean, re water reuse, you know, all those things are questions to ask, right, as part of a, a development, so. Um, okay. So that was the conversation anyway, and, and you have my notes from it, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I would like to see if we can, um, you know, sort of get this capacity analysis done for um, for the Toll Brothers development and you know we could probably roll in and vinyl at the mm -hmm. same time too. I think the, the issue there is going to be what does it cost to do it and how do we fund it. Right. Water Enterprise Fund. Yeah. Well I mean it could also be a, a cost of connecting to the water system too. It could be a development cost for the well, developer. Well I think now each hookup is was five. I think it might be six thousand dollars to hook up a house. Yeah, no, I'm not talking. I'm, I'm really, I'm sort of, I'm bifurcating this a little bit because, um, you know, I'm not really looking at an individual single-family home, but maybe more, you know, chunks of development where we're starting to talk about bigger, bigger components. I don't know whether you could do that for a single-family home. Um, but what I'm really talking about is not what it costs to hook up, but what it costs to analyze whether the capacity is there to hook up. It's all right. about deliverables. Right. And, and that's, that's a piece that I think we really need to, um, you know, work on, a, on an individual, individual development and have that analysis done. And if, of course, if they had the system already in place and they had sort of the tools, it would probably be a lot easier to do. But um, you know, we're starting from kind of uh, a bit of ground zero. So very interesting how our water system works. Or not. Or not. So one of the questions I would have is: is why has it been ignored? Is it a, is it definitely a a money issue? 
Is it definitely that? No, well, there's a lot of competing enough. demands, I think. I think yeah. that's the challenge, right, is that, you know, when, when the house is burning down around you, mm -hmm. um, you know, you try to put the fire out, you don't, you don't spend money on fire prevention for the right. house. Yeah. And I, I think it's a, been a bit of that. Um, so it's always been here, so it, it's always it, worked, so well, it's, it's always yeah, will it's, work. You know, it's an antiquated system. Yeah, well, um, I know that. We're right. actually, I guess, one of the, one of the few systems of our size that don't even have sort of remote Access control and data mm -hmm. acquisition you know um, they like I said they have on the on the groundwater pumps they have trouble alarms basically it's like a check engine light you know mm -hmm. yeah um, that's a long way for from where you could be today oh, right? Right. Uh, when I worked for CDO they, they don't even have a complete set of plans yeah I had to go to somebody's house in Buffalo and they brought us for the plans and said oh I was to CDO and it was hard to get to and it was when you were just doing the upgrade. Yeah. Um, it was I do believe they're supposed to get an updated set of plans as a fallout from this water main work that's going on. Um, but again, that could be pretty far down the road, right? And, yeah. and the thing I guess I was trying to encourage them to do is really think about um, trying to get this process moving now. Because the sooner you start, the sooner you'll get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think, and the other issue is we sort of need that answer now, right? Because we're, we're looking at development after development coming through the door, and we really need a sort of a more rigorous approach to saying, is the capacity available or not? And I think you have to couple that with sewer. Yeah, and sewer, I think, falls under the same category. Yes, it right? does. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so anyway, that, that was wanted to give everybody an update on that. Um, Karen? Here we have an update on uh, some developments that are coming in. Um, well, so several of the developments that we currently have are actually in the ASBEL uh, submission phase, so we will be winding up them hopefully in the next week with several projects getting, uh, you know, Planning board side off. And those are First um, Parish? First Parish. Yeah. We got the as built today for the um, Six Old Country Way. We have several stormwater permits that uh, hopefully, you know, they'll be submitting their as built and getting, mm -hmm. getting things signed off. Okay. Well, I guess we'll wait till we have that. <laughs> I think most of them, most of them look good. Okay. All right. Anything else? Um, I mean, if the board wants to discuss one question on 9397, First Parish, then um, Ben's going to have to move more. Because he's a director better. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're prepared to talk about it, yeah, why don't we do that? Okay. Would that be okay? Yeah. I'll yeah. Okay. Have to take all your stuff with you. you can't come back. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> well, I'll bring it to the car. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, on the um, today, I met with John Barry and his design and his landscape designer, and as a result of meeting with them, um, they they have done the buffer as you have requested, but they moved the buffer in some in some places in a little bit because they put the plants where the roots would grow well and the plants would grow well. Mm -hmm. And that seems to have been an issue with the abider that maybe the spirit of the buffer had been met. So they discussed it, then they came back five minutes later, they're gonna put 80 feet of fence in on the uh, west property line. So I think that issue is just going to go away. So okay. the five foot buffer um, and it is met. Um, and the only other issue is I think that I, I would say that the building design is substantially compliant with the approved, with the elevations that were permitted. Some of the windows have changed and the location of the uh, 
door, the entrance onto the porch has changed, but I think it's substantially compliant with the uh, approved, the plans that you reference in your planning board decision. And what about the elevations? That was the big issue. I think it's substantially compliant. The windows, some of the window locations changed. Are you talking height or are you talking height. the look? Height, height is, the building commissioner has already measured it and he has determined that it is compliant with height. There you go. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what the building commissioner, he enforces, he enforces that, so he's made that determination. So I think that that will be winding down in the next week. He's mm -hmm. going to be doing striping the parking lot um, this weekend. Fence is going up next week, and I'd say by the end of next week, he, I mean, we'll be ready to sign off on the stormwater permit and on-site plan review. We had our engineer go out, and he found it substantially compliant. Mm -hmm. Right, and the only thing I noticed is that are, were the things that you mentioned that I think they had, they added some windows and they reconfigured the windows from double to single or something like that. But, you know, at, at this point, it's probably one of those things that, um, you know, you're not going to go back and change right. that. Um, and I don't know that it made a material difference in the look and feel unless you guys think otherwise. Well, I have to say it looks better than what was there. might be bigger, but it does look. Yeah, well, I'll withhold judgment on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it is huge. There's no question about that. So they're putting the fence on the non-post or the non-old library side. Right. Now, are they moving the rain garden still? No, the rain garden's there. The rain garden was there, and they added three columnar hollies in there too. But they are going to. There's going to be a fence in there as well. Okay. Wow. And so. So the fence is going to go along where the the rain garden is and all that. It's the rain in between the rain garden and the property line. There's a very narrow distance. It's going to be on the property between the property line and the rain garden. But it won't disturb the rain garden. There's supposed to be a liner in there too. There's right? an impermeable liner. Yeah. There. there is a liner there. Yeah. So I think it's all coming. I think it's all coming together. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, with several projects ending all, you know, around the same time, yeah. um, it'll be. It'll be. And, and if I remember right, we said that it could be a landscape, it's a buffer, landscape buffer or a fence. Or a fence. Right. Yes. Okay. And do they plan to talk to the abutters about what they're putting up there? <laughs> they have tried to talk to the abutters, and the abutters. Um, don't want to talk? Yes. And right. so they, it was the decision after meeting today that they were just going to do the fence and be done with it. Okay. As long as they made the effort to talk to them. They, yeah. they have made the effort to talk. But they're just going to do the fence because then, mm -hmm. you know, they, they just want to move on. Gotcha. Blame them. Okay. Um, One other thing. Well, are you okay with I'm fine with that. Right. You okay, Bill? I'm fine. Okay. Um, we sent, or somebody sent out, I guess it was Laura, um, looking for fines from a number of different developers. Do we want to call Ben back in? Or if, if he's out, out there, there, we should just ask him to come on back. Okay. All right. Um, we were finding a few developers for various and sundry things. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Have they paid? They haven't paid, have they? Uh, frankly, I'd just like to let that go. I think that it, in one sense it was just not necessary. I'm not ready to let anything go until I know everything's been resolved. Okay, fine. Right? I mean, that would be sort of my position. And you know, frankly, the the fine was not just a fine so that, it, well, if they did everything okay, we waived the fine. It was really to
to motivate somebody to That's do right. what they should have done already. Right. And it is a bit punitive, and I agree with that, right? But um, it's kind of the message it sends. Um, but I, you know, the question is, are, are we done there yet? Right. Which, well, this is Blanchard Farms. This is Blanchard Farms, yeah. And I know Brad was talking to some people there, so. Yeah. So just as an update, so I met with Greg Morris and Richard Henderson, the attorney, um, and we had a, just a, a brief meeting. Um, and there's, I think it's very clear in the planning board minutes about what the expectation would be to kind of finish this up, you know, uh, close it out, if you will. So um, there, supposedly the, the Whatever construction needs to be done, I think there was additional free board required on the berm. Mm -hmm. um, I always told verbally that that's done, and that there's a preparation of an as-built depicting that with the necessary stamps and certifications that would be coming our way. And that was, you know, again, my intention of just trying to just close out the matter. Um, and also there was a... The they were fines. cleaning up the wall? Uh, they piled dirt up against the wall as well, something like that? So if you look through the minutes, the stockpile had been removed, and really the kind of outstanding issue was adding that additional free board on the burn. Right. And again, I was told verbally that that was done on lot eight. Mm -hmm. um, I said, well, if it's done, that's great. Put it on a plan, stamp it, and send it in. Mm -hmm. um, and also, we had issued fines to lot seven, but if you read the, the minutes, you had cleared lot seven. So I clarified that issue with the mm -hmm. lot seven developer saying that, you know, we're not proceeding, you know, we're not following up on these fines. It seems mm -hmm. it was sent to you an error. So we're really just following up with the developers of lot eight. Um, mm -hmm. And I, you know, I won't keep you posted, but that we had, I had that meeting about two weeks ago. So I'll send him an email to remind him. So you haven't seen anything yet? It's Not yet, but that, you know, I was, you know, okay. promised that I would get that plan. Okay, well, I would, I would respectfully request that we defer that conversation until after everything's been done. Okay. <laughs> and we're, we're sure, right? Is that okay? Sounds fine with me. All right. Um, anything else, Karen? No. And I will entertain Bill's motion. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Okay.